Hi, everybody. This is Pat. Pat, it's Matt Terrell. Hi. Matt, Hi, how are you? Thank you so much, Matt, for... Hi, everyone. We're on the live stream. Oh. Just as a reminder. Sorry, we went rogue yesterday, Matt. We were, I was talking when I wasn't supposed to be t talking, but thank you all so much. Steve. Thanks. Thank you for uh, promoting me to a uh, panelist. <laughs> That's right, Tyrone. <laughs> today, today you've been promoted. Thank you. You were fabulous yesterday, y'all were. No, it was pretty special yesterday. Hi, Ken and Nancy, this is Pat. I wanted to just thank you all so much for uh, participating today. Happy to be here, delighted.
Okay, thank you all for joining in for a second day of virtual conversations uh, on Black experiences in STEM higher education. Uh, we had a really powerful, compelling first day yesterday with a panel of staff members, students, faculty, to discuss a variety of different topics um, in the context of diversity, equity, and inclusion, particularly with a, a focus on Blacks, Black Americans, Black scholars in the academy. Uh, today, we're going to have a panel of deans to continue that conversation. Uh, and we're going to put, uh, put a particular focus on sort of a system-wide assessment and evaluation uh, in higher uh, education in STEM. Um, I'm going to serve as a moderator. I'm Tyrone Porter, uh, professor of biomedical engineering at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, my Co-host here uh, is Ruha Benjamin. If you can go ahead and please maybe introduce yourself. Absolutely. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ruha Benjamin. I'm an associate professor of African American Studies at Princeton, and uh, the founding director of the Ida B. Wells Just Data Lab. Thanks so much uh, for that. Um, we have a panel once again of deans from uh, universities across the country from the West Coast all the way to the East Coast. I wanna first and foremost, thank you all for taking the time in this period where a lot of really tough, hard decisions are being made with regards to the pandemic that continues to uh, spread across the country. Um, this is an important topic of discussion we're having as well today. Uh, I'm going to start off with uh, just framing and contextualizing the conversation here a little bit, and then I'll open the floor to you all, the panelists, uh, to help drive this conversation. So first and foremost, I want to just call to attention once again the murder of George Floyd, as well as other Blacks at the hands of the police in the U.S., and the severity with which COVID-19 has disproportionately hit communities of color, has really drawn attention to the racial inequities that plague the U.S. on so many fronts, including higher education. Uh, the disparity is particularly severe in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, where there are, there are appallingly low numbers of students, faculty, and senior leaders of color. There's a call to action that has swept across the country like I've never seen before in my 47 years on this earth including shut down STEM and shut down academia events that happened in early June, where faculty, students, staff, uh, and senior leaders took the day off to read, discuss, reflect, and craft plans to address the systemic problems. The current two-day virtual discussion is part of the movement, and we hope to gain greater insight into the nature of the systemic barriers that have hindered increased representation of persons of color in STEM higher education. So we've invited you, the panel of distinguished deans from some of the nation's most prestigious universities to share your perspectives on this watershed moment and the need for a system-wide transformation and change. So first and foremost, I'll ask you to introduce yourself. And I actually will go based on my screen here, which sort of looks like the Brady Bunch, kind of telling my age once again here. But I have Matthew Terrell at the very top going across to Ken Luchin and Nancy Aubertan, and I'll come back down. So I'll ask you to please introduce yourself to the university that you're at, and then please share your perspective on this moment and how it may be leveraged for systemic change in order to make STEM higher education more inclusive and equitable. Should I go first then, Tyrone? Yeah, thank you. Okay, my, my name is Matt Terrell. I'm uh, the Dean of the Pritzker School of Molecular Engineering at the University of Chicago, which is uh, less than a decade old as the first engineering school at the University of Chicago. My own uh, background is in polymer science with applications to new materials and nanomedicine. I've been a, a Dean or a department head for 25 years, starting at Minnesota, then at Santa Barbara, then at Berkeley and now for the last nine years at, at Chicago. Um, this uh, last uh, 
month and a half or however long this has been in such sharp focus has really been, you know, a, a kind of, as Tyrone implied, a kind of a, a wake up call, a, a kick in the rear end uh, and a call to action. And as an administrator, I think it's really brought home, and I'll, I'll try not to say everything because we have plenty of colleagues around here, but it's really been a, 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 a realization that, you know, this is not something that can be patched up. One needs a serious strategy about how to deal with the circumstances that have led to the situations that we're talking about here. We can't delegate this to a staff member or, or something like that. We, as administrators, have to learn and have to um, get all of the faculty and administrative resources we can to bear on this. Like I said, it's not something that's going to be handled by a diversity office. I, I think that's, I have a lot more to say, but so does everybody. So I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, thank you. So Ken Luchin, Dean Luchin, please. Thanks, <clears throat> Tyrone. I'm Ken Luchin, Dean of the College of Engineering at Boston University. Uh, I've been dean for about 12 years. And before that, I was the chair of the biomedical engineering department here at BU. Thanks for inviting me to be part of this discussion, uh, Tyrone. Um, I'll say a few things about this. First, a little bit from a general point of view about how these recent events uh, have created a, a very unique set of circumstances. And my feeling is that it really has has sincerely opened up a window of, or an opportunity uh, for people that, to, that, are, that are able to, or being, or, or able, or willing to be educated in a much deeper way and in a much more aware way, in a much more comprehensive way about the unique way in which particularly black people and, and people of color have been uh, uh, subject to uh, either explicit or implicit racism and the kind of way it impacts their lives. Um, I've run into this over the last month and a half where you get people who say, I know how you feel because I've been uh, the only female faculty member in a room or one of only a few. Or my parents uh, were Jewish and, and, and persecuted over in Europe. And I have to remind them that no, that's not the same thing. That, that nobody pulls over a car that runs at a red light because there's a female in it or a Jewish person in it. Nobody shoots somebody that jogs in their neighborhood because they're female uh, and the only female that's jogged there for the last couple of months or they're um, a, a certain religion. But that is happening to black people of any economic sector, any professional sector and so forth. And there's a lot of other aspects of their lives that should make which added a huge amount of complexities. And, and this is a conversation that is, is now we can, we can have an opportunity to have in a deeper way. Uh, it, it gives an opportunity to have, let people engage in more complex and frankly, very uncomfortable discussions from both our black colleagues and students, uh, as well as uh, our white colleagues who also may not be comfortable having these kind of discussions. Um, it's a way for them to understand that, that in a deeper way that it's racism stems from a group of people that feel a need to be uh, superior to some other people. And as a consequence of that, either advocate for or don't push against policies that push racism forward. The, la the na last thing I wanna say here or less level of that in the general way is, but everything I've set up to now is sort of societal um, uh, uh, perspective. I also think it's a chance for people as individuals to look inside themselves and ask themselves some complicated, complex, difficult questions about how they, when they're conversing with people, when they're deciding how to lead, when they're deciding how to be members of a community, do they do things that proliferate uh, racism in ways they may not even be aware of? And how do they get, how are they willing to be confronted about that, uh, both in a passive and an aggressive way? So I think those kind of discussions are important. And with regard to STEM education, obviously this is that's what the focus of, of the conversation is today. Uh, it gives us all uh, a deeper way to start a discussion about how do we deeply get people to internalize not just 
the need to be more diverse, which is just accounting phenomena, but the deep way in which inclusion and making people feel a sense of belonging greatly amplifies the community that you're in, in every dimension imaginable, as opposed to just getting people to buy into, as was in the past, we need to be more diverse from a numerical point of view. And I think I'll stop there. Oh, thank you, uh, uh, Ken, it's very profound. Uh, please, Nancy, if you will. Yes, thank you, Tyrone. And thank you to the organize, organizers for the in, invitation. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I've been uh, the Dean of Engineering at the uh, College of, uh, at the University of Washington in Seattle for all of about seven or eight months. Prior to that time, I was at uh, UNC and NC State as chair of the Joint Department of Biomedical Engineering. I mean, I have to say, you know, uh, this is an excruciating, painful time as the prior deans have brought up. But it's, it's pretty clear our interconnectedness um, and that we now need to step up to the plate. Uh, I think it's very clear to everyone that the institutional racism, uh, the uh, numerous structural inequities that oppress people of color and hold people back. And this is a world where we need everyone participating. Uh, but I'm also somewhat encouraged that we've reached a moment where we're gonna see real action uh, there's a real call to collaboration and accelerated movement, but also sustainable action, action that's going to last beyond the next year or two. Um, one of the things our DEI leaders at uh, UW said that I, I really kind of liked a lot, so I thought I'd share it, and it particularly resonated with me, is that talk without action is just talk, but action without talk is usually misguided. And I think that as a new dean, that rings true to me. Um, if I just, talking is really easy. You can say all sorts of stuff, but really never do anything. On the other hand, if you come in and you don't hear anything around you and you take action, the best you can hope for is not to make things worse. So really it's a combination of the two to, to help us begin to move forward and then address some of our, the inequities in our system. And I think it's also a great time to be a new dean because I can kind of take a step back and look at the um, UW and the world around me and how I'm going to move forward. And my thoughts are looking at this at a really systemic level is that we have to be very holistic in how we move forward. Uh, we have individuals, institutional and systemic levels of bias and racism. So we need to confront it on the individual level. Uh, the institutional policies clearly need to be transformed um, and really changed from top to bottom at all levels. Um, and this has to be done at an accelerating pace. It can't be uh, business as usual at the same speed we've done in the past. And then I also like to think if you're, uh, if you're really going to act and do things, you've got to have funding commitments. And then finally, I think while this has to be owned at everyone's level, it's really the top, the dean, that has to say, this is important, this is my priority, and we are going to do this. And so with that, Tyrone, I'll just thank you again for the invitation and I'll uh, hand it over to the next Dean. Oh, thank you so much, Nancy. I think you brought up a number of points that I, I feel like we're gonna really touch on today during this conversation. And so thank you for that introduction. Uh, Dean Sharon Wood, please. Hi, thank you, Tyrone, and thanks to everyone for inviting me to participate today. Um, I'm Dean of the Capital School of Engineering. I've been in that position for seven years, and before that, I was the Department Chair of Civil, Architectural, and Environmental Engineering here at UT Austin. So I wanna echo what the, my colleagues have said, that this really is a time for action. And I think one of the things that I've noticed, and it, I think th these series of webinars really come to it, is just the way many people are willing to communicate. I think if I had engaged a group of, of black students uh, four months ago, they would not have been anywhere near as honest with me. And they would have, they would have kind of, sh wouldn't have shared as much. And so I think they have given us great guidance on the, the struggles they are facing. And it, as Nancy mentioned, this is happening at, at all levels, but I think it gives us much more perspective now on what we can do to make a real difference. And so while, all of us will have to come up with our own plans. 
and it will be much slower than, than the students would like, I think we now are hearing voices that, that really were silent before. All right, thank you so much, uh, Dean Wood. Uh, next we have Dean uh, Steve McLaughlin from Georgia Tech, and then we'll have Emil Petrie close it out. Hi everybody, I'll, like all the, all the other deans, I really appreciate being uh, included in this. And thanks uh, uh, Tyrone and, uh, for all of your leadership in, in pulling this together. I'm Steve McLaughlin. I'm the Dean of Engineering at Georgia Tech. I've been at Georgia Tech for 25 years. I'm an electrical engineer, previously the chair of the School of Electrical uh, Computer Engineering. And I think certainly relevant to me, I think relevant to the discussion, I'm an extraordinarily proud father of a young man of color. Um, and so many of these issues uh, are run very, very deep in our, in our families. And whereas I probably haven't had, or I certainly haven't had a lot of the experiences that many of the folks watching this have had, uh, certainly seeing him through his teen years, he's now 21, uh, had an enormously profound impact on me. I bring tremendous uh, energy to this to this topic. I think, as you've heard, like most others, absolutely determined to not let this this moment pass. Um, I kind of debated about whether to talk about this. We have a saying in our family: uh, "Tend to the obvious," uh, and I think it's certainly obvious to me, and I think it's been obvious uh, obvious to all the everybody who's watching is that all the faces that have spoken before mine are white. Um, and I know that that has come up. I did have a chance to uh, spend, uh, uh, to visit in on, on a lot of the sessions yesterday. And so um, this kind of thing okay, came up over and over again. And I'm certainly asking myself, um, is this a problem? Uh, is this the problem? Um, are the people that are here, the deans, uh, the ones that are the solution, that are part of the solution? Uh, those are all the questions I'm asking myself, and I'm sure everyone is, is, is asking. I think the only other thing I'll say before I, uh, I know we're going to get into a bunch of other things, and it's interesting, this has been on my mind for about the last 10 days. A couple of moments of clarity um, have, have happened, and one of the students in the student session yesterday brought it up. So look what's happened in the last four months. You know, we've gone completely online. All of our faculty, all of our staff in a short period of time have rallied together um, and gone offline, uh, you know, in teaching. Look what's happened in the last week with the ICE um, you know, proclamation around graduate students, international graduate students that was just reversed yesterday and how quickly the community rallied in an enormous and cohesive way uh, to defend our international students. At Georgia Tech um, in the last week, almost a thousand of our faculty spoke up in a matter of three days, uh, signed a petition um, around, around masks. And so we clearly have the ability, our faculty, our staff, our institutions have the ability to rally in an enormous and huge and fast way, in a cohesive way around other topics. And I think we'll have to ask ourselves, um, why not this? Why not this? And so, whereas I know everyone, all of my, my colleagues uh, see this as a moment that we are absolutely not gonna let this pass and are totally committed to, but there's something different. We talked about the difference that everyone's feeling in the nation, but yet are we gonna have that same energy, that same commitment, that same rallying that we've, we've just experienced in the last four months. And I hope, um, I hope we can harness some of that energy of our faculty and our community to do the same thing uh, for black students. No, thank you so much, Steve, for first and foremost, um, bringing that up. Uh, it was a very powerful moment yesterday and um, you need to run for political office. Um, <laughs> I want well, to. I, um... I am a politician. You know, someone said that before. <laughs> you should be a politician. I said, no, I am a politician. I want to uh, open the floor to uh, Mill Petrie here, who was a, a really good friend. And actually, um, he mentioned this yesterday. Uh, I've known Emil Petrie since I was a graduate student, just trying to find my way. Uh, and he served as a role model. And um, to sort of speak to what Steve has brought up here. Uh, he showed me what was, what was possible. 
he definitely was a guiding light for me when I was a graduate student and an inspiration for me to go into education. And so I agree with you wholeheartedly, Steve, on your comment that you just made. And so Emil, please introduce yourself to the rest of the community. Thank you so much, Tyrone. Tyrone is one of our pride and joys. Um, I've been at the University of Washington. Um, my name is Emil Petrie, first of all. And I've uh, been at the University of Washington off and on since 1967. And we were uh, part of the effort to change the face of diversity at the University of Washington in 1968. Uh, I was a graduate student in chemistry at the time. Since then, I've worked in industry for a few years, but I uh, decided that my, to devote my whole career to um, helping underrepresented minorities, first generation and disadvantaged students to succeed in the ivory, if you will. Today I'm representing the Vice President for Minority Affairs and Diversity and the University Diversity Officer, Ricky Hall. Um, currently I serve as a, his senior advisor, but I uh, retired for six years ago as a, an associate vice president for diversity, uh, for assessment in the Office of Minority Affairs and Diversity. And so we've devoted 50 years to uh, improving in an effort to improve the participation and representation of Blacks, Indigenous, and Latinx students um, in STEM. It's been our whole effort. And I'm so pleased with what I've heard from the deans that now we have a partner in this and who is serious about this. You know, I've heard about this as a pipeline problem, um, but the pipeline is not dry. What we have is a, a bottleneck at the entrance and then at different levels along the way, the bottleneck again and then toward the end, it's been very thin. So we're looking at undergraduate, graduate, and then the faculty. So um, I'm very encouraged and, and we always say that diversity is not the work of the Office of Minority Affairs and Diversity or other DEIs, but it is um, that of the entire university. And we also want to emphasize that diversity is an asset, it's not a liability. And it should be interwoven throughout all the fabric of the University of Washington. And so I'm so pleased that um, folks are taking a positive um, approach to this. And Office of Minority Affairs will be very happy to partner with you on this effort. Um, we need we need um, stronger financial aid. We uh, quite a few of uh, black students enter the university, uh, admitted to the University of Washington, but they have choices and support from donors. And we know the university is committed; it has been committed for 52 years, and there's no reason to believe that that will not happen in the future. So I'm pleased to be here and uh, I'm pleased to be among such august panelists. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you everyone for those initial introductions and reflections. It's my um, honor and pleasure to be invited into this conversation as a sociologist and someone who studies the social dimensions of science, technology, and medicine. Um, one way I think about the two strands of the conversation that we're having, one is a kind of diagnostic mode and another is a prescription mode. And so um, too often we, as, as was mentioned, jump to prescription without fully diagnosing the layers and the extent of what ails us. And I think that this is just a start. 
you know, we are um, having this really broad view conversation, but I think um, how we understand the issues and problems that we're up against will vary depending on institution, um, depending on region of the country, um, depending on what kind of, you know, status of students we're thinking about. I also think that there are many continuities between um, what you're ha what you were talking about in, in STEM and engineering with other parts of the university. And so some things are unique to your field and then some of the di dynamics as we know are shared across humanities and social sciences. So perhaps my, com my contribution can also be one to connect those dots um, so that we can see what is unique and what isn't. So to kick things off as we do a deeper dive, I invite um, anyone who um, uh, has a response. And for this, you can just put your hand up classroom style. We don't have to necessarily go in that same order and you don't necessarily have to respond to every single question that Tyrone and I pose. But this first question is inviting you to reflect on the practices and policies that um, you can you think contribute to the underrepresentation of Black, Latinx, Indigenous students in STEM higher education, and also your thoughts on how that can be addressed. Please, Dean Luchin, uh, and then Dean McLaughlin. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I have a variety of thoughts that are not necessarily connected, but they're they're, they're part of it. Is a let me say something right out, right out at the beginning. We're deans of engineering schools, and and uh, there's been a lot of this of the dialogue is around STEM, as if all science, technology, computer, and engineering programs is one discipline. But in fact, it's a deep concern of ours about engineering in particular. Um, so that's that's one thing, and and, and there's a particular concern about uh, how do we amplify the success of students of color to get access to, to get into and succeed in engineering. Now, at the risk of, um, of uh, annoying some of my colleagues, computer science by itself is not engineering. And so there's efforts to get more students into computer science too, which is good, but that doesn't solve the problem of the need to amplify the number of underrepresented people of color in engineering fields. Uh, I've actually seen people push a narrative, people uh, that were high up in NSF, that one way to solve this problem is have all students take the uh, AP exam in computer science, which to me, hmm. and the message was we're giving up on being able to prepare them for the math and science they need to get into engineering and we'll push everybody into one field. That's not a, that's not a solution in my, in my opinion. So there's a few things to bring up. First of all, there's an inherent um, policy constraint in my opinion, and it has been for years, and it's only now starting to change because of COVID. It's the SATs and the GREs, which create a huge barrier to people that are from low income neighborhoods or neighborhoods that where they cannot be pay money to get extra preparation to do be competitive on the SATs. The fact that many schools are not using them next year, I hope that sustains itself. It, it, my school is guilty of the policy of SAT optional. I think that's crazy. If I get fired because of that, <laughs> because it makes people immediately assume if you didn't submit them, there must be a reason. And so I think uh, uh, SATs and GREs are, are, have a similar issue. I think another point is you know, uh, Tyrone sent around an article which pointed out that the percentage, it, with a link to uh, references, the percentages of black students trying to get into STEM fields, and it just said STEM, it didn't break it down by field, is the same as the percentage of white people trying to get into STEM fields. That ends up being, if that holds up, it would be you would expect the same percentage of black students getting a degree in engineering as there are uh, percentage of white students relative to their amount, but it doesn't work out that way because of the leaky pipeline. So there's a lot of policies that need to be put into place and new, new um, initiatives to address that issue. And we can talk about those later if you'd like it. And the last thing I'll say and I'll lead it to my colleagues is um, the, the issue is you, not, you need to inform much more clearly 
what is engineering at the K through 12 levels? You need to excite kids about why I would want to go into engineering. Why is that exciting? Why would I want to do that to have a fulfilling life because of its impact on society? And then you have to make sure that they can get the preparation needed to get into an engineering school. And I don't think there's been enough holistic integrated approaches to all three, particularly the latter, um, because each of our schools says, well, we can't accept people from that particular school. So I'll stop there and let other people. Uh, thanks, thanks, Ken. Um, it, it, you were kind of highlighted the, uh, mostly from the student perspective, when I thought of uh, kind of systemic uh, systemic challenges or policy challenges, I kind of came at it from the, the faculty standpoint, you know, our own institutions, academia. And I think it's, there's the, I don't know if the right word is contradiction or dichotomy or whatever, whatever the right word is. You know, we, we come from institutions that are largely liberal, that are largely have um, e even personal beliefs in our own research that's very open, very collaborative, a very, uh, largely inclusive, at least in terms of internationally. And so we think that academics themselves, you know, have this mindset that would be open and, um, and conducive to a more inclusive and diverse uh, professoriate, our colleagues, and yet that doesn't happen. And that when it comes to how it is we choose our colleagues, how it is we recruit, um, how it is we hire, uh, we tend, academics tend to see not only uh, people, they tend to gravitate towards people that not only look like them physically, but look like them intellectually. And it's a contradiction or a dichotomy that I really would love to, so we have this asset in our faculty that is generally open, uh, generally um, in favor of, of uh, diversifying our faculty, but yet when we come to that point, uh, uh, not enough happens. I think then that persists. It persists through, through the recruitment, through the hiring, through the promotion, um, all, all the way through. And that kind of how we leverage what I think is a very, very supportive culture, when I, how we leverage a very supportive professoriate, but yet, yet we have not come anywhere close to, um, to delivering on that because of our own intellectual, what I think it see of as our intellectual beliefs and kind of the need to uh, unleash those. Me or Nancy? <laughs> um, let's have uh, Nancy and then Matthew. Matthew. Yeah, so there's a couple of uh, points I wanna really highlight that I think both Steve and Ken kind of touched on. And that's the problem with representation. If you talk to students, uh, they often uh, may not see themselves. They may not have a community to share experiences and to really talk to people that they feel are supporting them and understanding them. So figuring out ways to develop this community as we work to improve our other uh, challenges and problems, I think is one thing. And I think Steve is ever so right about the firing, about the hiring of the faculty uh, that the faculty do. Um, I've seen faculty uh, have really good intentions, but good intentions aren't best practices. And I think what you can do is overlay a set of best practices. They have to follow a rubric um, that they set out before they begin hiring other faculty. They have to justify at each step why they're moving forward, why they're, uh, who they're interviewing, et cetera. And then they can also justify ahead of time uh, things that are really important, like uh, require diversity statements, make sure that's part of what's evaluated when faculty are hired. And this can really change the dynamic. And one of our departments where we added that in, suddenly a whole bunch of people uh, no longer made the cutoff because uh, they just were not able to come up with anything reasonable, which means they're unacceptable faculty at the UW. I think another thing we often don't do is collect metrics and data. So we don't even know where our failure points are, where we're falling short, and we try and start trying to fix stuff and we may fix something that's not the problem, but we miss something else. I think that's a pretty critical thing. Another thing you'll see in engineering a lot is this kind of uh, sink or swim attitude, prove that you belong. I think that's gotta change. Uh, that's an unwelcoming environment. 
even a, a lot of our physical spaces aren't welcoming. You don't walk in and you don't feel like you belong. You feel like you should leave and go somewhere else. So I think we have to pay attention to all of these different dynamics. And finally, the last thing I want to talk on, we've talked about access, access but I think if you have access and no support, uh, that's a, a, a very bad mistake. So with access, we need to put in all of the different support systems and opportunities to help people succeed rather than throw them. It's like throwing someone in the deep end without trying to teach them how to swim first. You would never do that. And we shouldn't be doing that in engineering and academia. So I think there's a whole host of things at different levels that we as deans, I feel that I need to work on. Well, this, what I wanted to say follows up a little bit on what Steve said in particular, I, I think. I mean, I think the systematic uh, practice or policy or something that I wanted to highlight is what you might call elitism. You know, we all think that we want to have elite institutions, uh, but I think the, the corollary to that in practice, uh, which we wouldn't necessarily own up to is that we think everybody that comes to us has to come from an elite place or something that, you know, has some imprimatur of, uh, of something. <laughs> and I, you know, I've, I've learned a lot in this last day and a half, but what, what I'm going to say now comes from the graduate student panel on which there were a couple of uh, students from historically black colleges and universities, uh, one of which is in our program at uh, Chicago, and uh, I really heard what it was like for them, and uh, I, I think it's uh, uh, something that those of us who like to think of ourselves as elite ought to pay more attention to, the kind of environment that those uh, students uh, grew up in, but also the, the fact that there's a, a rich source of talent that could move into other sectors of our academic enterprise if we took the time to connect with, with it. And it's going to take some outreach, but um, I think it'll be interesting and, and rewarding. No, uh, I, I, all of the responses really got my wheels turning here. And um, a few things I want to, I want to sort of echo here is Matthew's contribution here, this idea of a, being elitist. Uh, we also hear in adjectives that are used frequently, prestigious, uh, selective. At their very core, they're somewhat reek of exclusive, exclusivity uh, and exclusion. Um, and so there's a lot of faculty that it sort of permeates the culture and the climate within the university and the faculty then are immersed within that as well as students get immersed within that. And it gets to become very competitive and not as collaborative and cooperative as it really needs to be. Um, I'm a product of an HBCU. I went to Prairie View A&M University uh, and as well as Ruha. Ruha went to Spelman and Emil went to Southern University, a good swack brother, which is in uh, uh, Baton, Rouge, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Uh, I haven't lost my Southern accent just yet, Emil. <laughs> Uh, and so I, I agree with Matthew here. I mean, it would be really good. Now I actually want to sort of pivot here to this question of student persistence, because I agree. I, uh, my wife went to Hampton University and that climate and culture, we were embraced, we were welcomed, we were sort of supported and advocated at all levels uh, from the chair, the faculty members, the students helped each other. Uh, and it'd be nice if that could be somehow integrated and adopted and maybe for me and working in partnership with HBCUs and not just to get their students, because I can tell you as a product, they're not going to like you just showing up on the campus and saying, just feed us your students. That's not going to work. It needs to be a constructive, productive relationship where there's a sort of a give and take where both are learning from each other. But I do want to visit this question of persistence. And I, I actually, I see Sharon's hand. And maybe this just opens up a little bit of a conversation because I'm uh, we're, we're fine with that. So we have Sharon and then Emil. Tyrone, I wanted to follow up a little on your comment about the HBCU. Because your experience there is so different than if you are a Black or Hispanic student coming to a, a, 
predominantly white university. And I've always thought that if we could have some sort of exchange program where the, the black students at Texas could go experience what it's like to be in the majority, that they would have so much more confidence when they came back to, to us. And similarly, perhaps the providing other types of experiences for the students at HBCUs, like the REU program where they get to do research in the summer. But I think if we can have an even handed or an, an even exchange program, we have a possibility of success that could really cultivate um, this inclusive culture. Yeah, Emil, please. Uh, Emil, you're still on mute. Emil, you're still on mute. What I'd like to hear more about is, is the undergrads. I mean, there are students at PWIs that can be successful um, and have been. It's just that the number has been very small. And there have been issues with um, the way students feel about uh, they're being the way they're being taught, uh, having access to opportunities. And Nancy spoke a bit about that, and that's something I've heard uh, for the last thirty years that um, that they don't feel like um, they get the proper support in the departments, in the colleges, and from the professors. They get the impression that the professors are more interested in their research publishing papers being cited internationally and not focusing on and leaving the teaching up to graduate students, many of them who students have difficulties even understanding what they are doing. But it's the way that we found that you can uh, take students who are at the, the margins, if you will, of academic preparedness and we can get them ready to excel once they get to, to the major. Um, I, uh, so I wanna hear more about what we do about getting them ready for graduate school, getting them through. And um, Nancy mentioned about data, we've been keeping data. I can tell you right now, over a 10 year period, how many uh, black students, Latinx, indigenous, who've earned degrees in the different departments at uh, the University of Washington. And uh, if you compare the percentage who have done so with those with the overall student body percentage, it's half or less than half. Uh, for instance, I just, we have a lot of bioengineering folks here, so <laughs> eight blacks have earned degrees, bachelor's degrees at UW in bioengineering between 2009 and 2019. So it's gonna take us forever to change things if we, we stay at that pace. So we gotta up, up that. And, and so that's one of the areas that I'd like to see the deans uh, address. Yeah, so uh, I saw uh, Steve and then Sharon and then Ken here um, to because that I actually want to try to unpack that a lot more uh, in this conversation. So please, uh, Steve and then Sharon and then Ken. It, it just really quickly touch on a, on a couple of things. I think one that I think almost everyone is really familiar with, you know, the the efforts that we have that many have in the College of Engineering at the Institute. Uh, our center, uh, Felicia Benton Johnson yesterday spoke, our Center for uh, uh, Engineering Education and Diversity, and we got a similar organization uh, campus-wide, but you know, really those programs that engage students uh, in, in mentoring, both in recruiting and mentoring through, through their programs, uh, the, the data is, really, is very compelling that those students persist at much higher rates than the students that don't engage and strongly connect in the in those programs. So, but I think most people are aware of that. The one thing I want to talk about um, that I've been hearing tons about, and we heard it from students yesterday, is is the classroom, is how uh, students of color feel excluded in the classroom when it comes to forming teams, when it comes to conversations. Uh, students feel excluded, don't feel included, and in how it is we equip our faculty to 
to conduct the classroom in a way that's much more inclusive. And there's a lot of data and there's there are best practices um, around how to do that. And I think that, that I've heard that's one of the loudest uh, comments or concerns that I've heard from students uh, in the, certainly in this time, but uh, leading up to this. I wanted to mention it to Anil's comment. Um, we have started a program for the students who um, came from the, the high schools that had less preparation. This gets to some of Ken's comments about the SAT and the GRE scores if you're from a socially disadvantaged background. But it's, especially in Texas, there's huge disparity between the urban high schools and the more rural or the inner city high schools. And so we're, we're able to attract students from these high schools because of our admissions policies, which is a state law. Um, but they come in and they don't have the calculus that students in the urban high schools had. And so we, we try, really tried to focus on how do we retain these students? How do we build cohorts for them and have this continue much longer than the cohorts that for the, the freshmen coming in normally? So by having a two-year program now, it's primarily first-generation students. We have seen increases in our retention rates and it's been very successful. I, I think Steve is right though, that the, the comments I'm hearing from our students are that um, they're, they don't feel included. Even as the numbers of the black and Latinx and indigenous students are going up, they still don't feel like they're part of, part of groups. And so really trying to educate the faculty on these problems and making them aware of them, I, I hope can be helpful. Um, okay, and please. Yeah, a couple of comments, some of which Ted done it with my colleagues. But first of all, I was watching the, talking about HCBUs, I was watching a faculty panel yesterday, I think five of the seven faculty, which I don't think they knew in advance each other, is, uh, were from an H, HB, uh, HCBU. Uh, and, and they were spectacular, these faculty, in every dimension you can, you can imagine. And so the idea of not just partnering with, with, um, with the HCBUs, but actually I go deeper, I use the word relationship and, and figuring out ways uh, to not hope that some students cross paths and maybe come to graduate school, but funding, and uh, you know, we all talk about REU programs. You can create your own REU program and resource it with your own discretionary funds. You don't have to get money from NSF to make that happen if it's a high enough priority. That, that's point one. Um, I also think it's critical uh, to go to the point that Emil was talking about is, and, and, and Steve as well, is um, getting all of our faculty, not just the faculty of color, to realize, to deeply understand the unique challenges these students face when they get to a graduate school, let's say a regular R1 institution from an HCBU or come in as an undergraduate, having lived, never lived as a minority before that, the unique way in which they feel marginalized or isolated and I think it's more than just including them. It's figuring out a way to make them feel a sense of belonging, both from the majority white kids wanting and making them feel like it's important if they belong, and for them to feel that it's a sense of belonging, that they haven't just been included because of some percentage need of a certain number of students on certain committees and so forth. Um, what I heard from the students, graduate students yesterday, was a deep appreciation for their mentors. Um, particularly those that had mentors and faculty of color, uh, in a, probably a deeper way than I am. I, I internalized it before I listened to that panel. It was really a powerful one. And um, we have to, and, and then that flips to the other challenge of, well, wait a minute, you have faculty of color trying to get tenure and everything. Uh, how are we going to allow them to dive in and spend a lot of time making sure that uh, they can help as many of students that they want to try and help succeed along their pipeline. And we can talk more about policies to make that uh, uh, happen more readily rather than saying you, know, you shouldn't do that because it'll impact your tenure case. And the last thing I'll mention is, uh, it was a faculty, was it the faculty panel? I think it was a faculty panel where um, they raised the point of don't just include faculty of color in different committees, put them in charge of key committees, put them in charge of the graduate admissions committee with a mandate and some resources to go out to HCBUs and other schools and improve the uh, number of, increase the number of students that are excited to go on and can get into the graduate school. 
put them in charge of a search committee for faculty. And uh, that sends a powerful message to everybody. And the outcomes are perhaps more likely if you resource those individuals. I'll stop there. Um, so I Tyrone. just had a quick, uh, a quick uh, thought around the classroom context. And I'm just going to really try to condense this because I don't want to take up so much space on the panel. But you know, one of the things um, occurs to me is that the background noise of not just engineering, not just STEM, not just higher education, the background noise is the way that intelligence itself is that, that, that even the metric of intelligence has been so infected by racism, who we think of as intelligent and the role of scientists in producing that metric often is never discussed or even taught in our STEM courses, engineering or otherwise. I'm not sure if my screen is gonna share, but I'm gonna just take another 30 seconds just because I had the opportunity yesterday to talk to the computer science, uh, computer science uh, teachers of, a, of association. So computer science K through 12 all over the country. And many of them that are teaching students in a highly segregated country um, are not fully aware of this history of our, our fields. And so we think about the gradation of intelligence, again, the white noise that students, even those who are excelling in these fields have to contend with. It's taking up unnecessary brain space. And so what would it look like to actually address this explicitly in our classrooms, in our curricula, so that rather than it be the subtext that people think, oh, less of me, we, we look at someone like Georges Cuvier, French naturalist who conceived, helped conceive these distinctions between white and black looking at phenotype, looking at who is genius, who is barbaric. And then the way that that has our students, we get them in higher ed, but they've been contending with this since preschool. The fact that in this case, Yale School of Education put eye tracking technology on preschool teachers and told them to look for challenging behavior and their eyes consistently went to the little black boys in the, in the room. And then the way, again, that gets encoded into our digital our digital structures, whether it's in invisibilizing people or hyper surveilling them. And so again, this is the basis of my work. I'm gonna stop sharing, but it just occurs to me that we can have best practices on one level, but if we don't deal with the epistemic racism, the epistemic violence that's part of the history of these fields, at least to give voice to it, then it continues to be the unspoken subtext in which often our students are experiencing these encounters and they are they are hearing what's not being said. They are feeling what is being thought of them, even if people don't make it explicit. So why not just make it explicit and integrate it into the curriculum? Ruha, can I, I know I'm not the moderator, <laughs> but you know, one of the things that's come out of the many discussions at Georgia Tech in the last few weeks is you know, a required course on race, ethnicity, sexism, some kind of core course, um, across the Institute, 75% of our students study computer science engineering. So my question is, so in an engineering curriculum or in a STEM curriculum, how do we teach that? And because I've already given a challenge to the chairs of our departments is how are you in the next year gonna bring these topics into your class? And by the way, we can't add another course because we're already punishing our students with 132 hours. So I would love, I'm sorry, I know I'm not the moderator, mm -hmm. but I would love that input on how we do that, even episodically, even sure. in, in little bites, how do we bring this into the classroom into a primarily technical environment? And I have lots it's of thoughts that, and we can use that as a part two to this discussion, maybe for all <laughs> those who want to, but um, there's lots of models and, and different structures that that can take, but it's just great to hear that that's on the agenda. Yeah, it, it's such an important question and a difficult question to answer. I, I, I've been talking with my wife about how to craft um, a course that touches on race, uh, gender, ethnicity within the sciences, uh, physical and biological sciences, and also just looking broadly to see what is even out there. It's not a common course that's even taught 
So something would have to be created from the ground up. Uh, but you do bring up a really good point here, Steve. We're going to jump into some, some additional maybe constraints a little later of the course limitation. I mean, there's only so much room that you can pack information in. Where do you actually introduce that, right? Does it become integrated into every single course, which means now you have to retrain a lot of the faculty and the professors? Um, or do you have a separate course that then the faculty council and the provost and the regents and everyone has to basically vote on to get approval for? Um, so it, I'm glad you actually brought that question up and took the moderator seat, even only for a moment, <laughs> because it's a really it's, it's a really important point and really important question. Um, I'm going to I'm going to wait. Uh, Nancy had her hand up. So please, Nancy, please. and then Tyrone. Yeah, just quickly. I think, you know, at UW, we have an example of a course called Peers, where um, they specifically focus on for engineering students to read the literature about bias against underrepresented groups and particularly engineering. And so it's a focus. And I think it's modeled after a really nice course at UW. But I think the point is brought up, this should be content in every course. And I think there's no reason we as deans can't bring on the expertise to help our faculty understand how to integrate it into their courses. And you know, maybe this is, we all um, live and die by ABET. So maybe this is a conversation we need to have with ABET and that some of their ABET requirements should really touch on this which will really push it in a phenomenal way and very fast. So that would shake the academic sphere to its very core. <laughs> um, but it also sounds like something that would really, as you just mentioned, accelerate, potentially really sort of moving forward with this sort of transformation and change. So I want to, um, we're having this conversation right now really about sort of teaching pedagogy and faculty and sort of their engagement with the students. And I want to spend a little bit more time on that with this, uh, this panel. And so um, students increasingly are expecting equitable and inclusive teaching and advising and mentoring, right? Because they're coming out of high school, they're coming out of secondary education where they are interacting with their teachers on a regular basis, right? And maybe counselors, counselors from time to time. And so that's sort of their existence and that's sort of their expectation. So there's an increasing expectation to have equitable, inclusive teaching and advising and mentoring. So just going beyond the classroom, right? And working and talking with the faculty outside of the classroom. So how can universities work to better prepare faculty of all backgrounds to meet these expectations? So we have Nancy for that first. Yeah, I'll take a, a first shot at, it, shot at it and then let some of the other deans uh, follow up. So I'm a firm believer that I, you know, I know engineering, uh, but I don't know everything. Um, and so I need education. I need uh, to have an expert I can rely on. And so I think it's very important to bring on expertise. A lot of our faculty talk to me and they're very uncomfortable. And they want to do, they want to move forward, but they're not experts. And they're really, there's no reason to expect them to be. So I think what we need to do is bring on expertise that will work hand in hand in a very constructive and collaborative fashion with the faculty so that they can begin to feel comfortable to learn about topics that they're not necessarily experts, but then they can begin to introduce this into their class and begin to change the way. The other thing I think is, you know, you brought, we talked about undergraduates, but there's a huge opportunity in either design projects or research activities, asking faculty to have sort of an action plan. Um, this is how I'm going to mentor my students. This is how I'm going to change the way I'm doing. I'm going to make sure I have, you know, either, either I'm mentoring uh, Black undergraduates or graduates, and I'm going to be really their empowering person or I'm gonna go into the high schools and do it. So having some sort of a, a plan, it can't be just the deans or just the chairs. It's gotta be, everyone's gotta have a plan that they're gonna implement. And I think this could be part, you know, every year we review faculty and we give them a thumbs up or a thumbs down or please work harder. And I see no reason why this can't be part of their annual review process 
What did you do the last year? How are you doing? How do you know you were succeeding? What are your plans for the next year? So my sense is to get faculty moving forward and get students what they need, want, and deserve, we've got to have a structured, uh, put structure in place for the faculty so they can achieve and do the jobs they want, but also signal to them, hey, this is really, really important. This is how you're going to be judged. This is the Dean's priority initiative. And then it begins to become a pervasive culture. Um, and I think that's some of the things we need to start doing. I think I saw, saw Ken's hand there. Yeah, I want a um, couple of quick comments here. So everybody, I, I, many universities do academic advising slightly different. Some do it all by staff, some do primarily with faculty at BU, we do it by faculty. And um, as you might imagine, it, some faculty are a little more socially challenged than others. Um, and uh, and just, just distributing the students in an even-handed way to all faculty, regardless of considering how good they would be or not be, is not the, is, is a horrible uh, practice. And uh, I, I think in your BU we've done this. We've asked our chairs, who are your most, who are your best advisors? N n white, black, male, female, who are the ones that are most engaging that really care about the students' progress and have them be the academic advisors. And in particular, put, have them have a little, Get get them more of the uh, underrepresented students into their advising uh, a set of advisees. Uh, second, what Nancy said, we've actually put into place a um, an a, um, academic advisor evaluation uh, sheet that all students have to fill out uh, before they're allowed to register for the next semester. It's the only survey I know that gets 100% compliance because they can't register until they fill it out. And the students are told that the faculty's raise, merit raise, will move up or down a little bit, depending on if they're doing very well or poorly. And it does ask questions like, did your advisor ask you about what you're doing in the summer, about internship opportunities? And the questions change depending on what year the students is in the program. Um, and then uh, there's, there's feedback, of course, given to the faculty. But even then, I think you have to go even more deeper. We talked a little bit, might be getting ahead, about the role that faculty of color need to play or want to play, maybe is a better way to say it, in mentoring these students, uh, in addition to the academic advisor they're assigned to. And we've got to set up a policy that that's the passion of your academic um, faculty that are of color, that you have to give them a license to go ahead and, and, and do that without any um, statement that that's going to affect your tenure review policy. It's got to be part of the tenure package. In fact, I think you need to even want to resource that as part of their starter package if they bring it up. Where you give them some funding for a graduate student or something, maybe somebody over in sociology department, something that really will allow them to build a program in which they can amplify their mentorship capability or make mentorship professional goals and not have to do it by having to stay up until two in the morning every night to do all the other things. Uh, and we haven't done that, but it's just one of those new policy or, or initiatives that I've thought about since this uh, the, the new uh, uh, recent few months of since George Floyd was killed and the Black Lives Matter movement really took off. Yes, Matt, please. This may not need to be reinforced, but Nancy brought it up and I was going to bring it up in a different context, but I definitely think that having uh, goals, whatever we set together, be part of performance evaluation for faculty, not, not just mentoring, but effective participation in well-planned uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion activities should be part of annual performance reviews. I mean, the, the broader topic is how do we incentivize or enable uh, some of the activities that we want to enable with money. Uh, Ken mentioned a different one, you know, that we could invest in REU programs, but, it, you know, I do think that um, money that, that goes to individuals or to programs is an, an important tool to deploy toward the goals that we're talking about today. No, thank you so much, Aruha, actually. Uh, I think Steve... Steve sort of put his hand up, but I just want to just, I would be remiss if I didn't put in footnote to this part of the conversation. 
yes to money, yes to time, yes to uh, formalizing an incentive structure around this, but realizing that student evaluations in particular often um, uh, come back to harm faculty of color. And so if promotions and other things are predicated mainly or, or only on that, that's likely actually to penalize uh, faculty of color in many cases. So understanding that as part of the conversation. Um, Steve, you were gonna jump in. Uh, and all I was just gonna do, and I'll, I'll keep it brief because it reiterates what uh, both Matt and Nancy have said. And I think it's just really structuralizing uh, for, for faculty at the you know, diversity, equity, inclusion kinds of statements and commitments all the way from application to hiring to annual reviews. And I think as, as, as they've said, and I think more and more institutions are making that, um, making that commitment or structuralizing. I think it's also this uh, balance between top down and bottom up. And for sure, this is a space where leadership matters. And at the end of the day, so many of these things, and that's when I, we started over an hour ago, but it's really so much of what we deal with at Georgia Tech is cultural. These kind of cultural beliefs, cultural act, cultural oriented actions that, that our faculty have. So, so how, how um, and Nancy suggested, I'm just repeating what she said, you know, how faculty conduct their research groups and being much more structured and intentional about um, how, um, how we approach our students and how we engage them. Um, again, I think those things, we're having those conversations and I think um, those are beginning to build attraction, not just at these institutions, but I think really everywhere. I think one of the things we often hear about is that the, the faculty of color feel like they have a tremendous responsibility for diversity, equity, inclusion. And at least by making it, get it by um, trying to allow them to express the service that was previously hidden service and have that be part of their evaluation so it's explicit so that we all know about it. I think that's really important. Um, and maybe they're not serving on as many formal committees, but they're doing so much more in this hidden service area. And we have to weigh that, we have to um, take that into account. I think Ken wanted to add one more comment here. Is that right? I want to amplify Sharon's comment. I, I learned a long time ago that, you know, I used to tell junior faculty, uh, particularly when we hire people of color or females, you're going to be asked to be on a lot of different committees just because everybody's supposed to have a diverse this and a diverse that so on. And I used to tell them, on the other hand, you might be really, really passionate about something, some initiative, whether it's uh, DEI um, mentoring and programs, if you're or, um, either female or a person of color, whatever it is. And while you definitely should say no to something that you're not passionate about, so that you can be just, you, that some other committee can tick off that they've got a female or a person of color. You, I believe you should never discourage a faculty to not pursue beyond the scientific stuff in their teaching, uh, really uh, something that they're deeply passionate about. And it's just gonna come back to haunt that person for not being allowed to pursue their personal goals and come back to haunt the institution as well. And so if you're going to let people, not only encourage people to and understand why it's such a deep, passionate and time consuming activity, you're going to have to put policies in place that help them balance against that and, uh, uh, and, and resource it, frankly. But uh, saying to them, don't pursue it even though you're deeply passionate or do it on the weekends and evenings, that's just, that's just wrong, in my opinion. Can I just add one really, really quick thing? Because Ken, something you said really triggered. So uh, I've been the, the Dean just three years and finally now I'm sitting at the final promotion tenure committee at the Institute. And I've seen a really marked difference between what takes place in how we value s some of these contributions, how that happens at the, ins at the highest Institute level and at the college level and at the school level. That's, those are our three, three levels and I'm really, uh, encouraged and hopeful that at the highest level, these kinds of contributions are much more valued, whether it's teaching and it's service and all those contributions. College level, quite a value. And like you can, maybe I'm going to get fired after this next statement. You know, maybe we can commiserate together. I think the problem really resides at the school level, at the department level. When you see 
and hear some of the things that are said and written that come out of those committees, they're much, much more traditional. Um, I don't, I think those are the places where we really need to, uh, I don't know that I think those are the places where that the value or the appreciation for those contributions don't come out because I, I'm now seeing at the, at the university level, absolutely. Those are, um, they, they are valued at that level much more so than I ever uh, realized. Okay, thank you. I am going to um, ask an audience question now. We have some great questions coming in. Um, and so, uh, and bef before I do, I'll just note in that last bit of the conversation, we're talking about encouraging, mentoring, and so on. I just want to note that um, students are not simply mentored or not mentored, but often they are negatively mentored <laughs> as well. And that often comes from the majority um, faculty who, um, you know, in all kinds of ways. So there's, in that, it's not just a neutral position of not mentoring. And so there needs to be plans in place to deal with and mitigate that. Because as sitting in the social sciences, I often receive the students who leave um, other fields early on because of those negative experiences who have all of the, the know-how, but they cannot, they don't wanna deal with that, that culture and that, and that negative mentoring. So I'll just put that on the table if it comes around. So audience question. The percentage of black faculty in engineering has remained around two and a half percent since 2006. Um, the number of tenured black faculty is even lower. This has not been addressed for years. How do you plan on making changes going forward? What is your two, three and four year plan to make this happen? Yeah, Nancy. Yeah, I'll take a stab. So one of the most interesting things that I learned as a new dean, and actually I learned this from the provost, is that uh, we've done somewhat better at getting uh, PhD students. Not great, uh, but in uh, 25 years, we've got about 10%. So lots of improvement. But in most professions now, you have to do a postdoc. And that's kind of the gateway into a faculty or a career. But there's some, for some reason, there's the stunning bottleneck between graduate student and postdoc. And so now that I've become aware of this, I think we need to not put a lot more effort. Surely we need to put uh, efforts at all levels, but clearly one of the biggest pain points for whatever reason is going from grad student to postdoc. So whether we do uh, programs like the California Alliance or the NSF AGEP program, but we do it big time not little bitty things, but in a way big form. Are we built, you know, in talking to some of the, uh, the grad students and postdocs asking them, well, why don't you want to go into academia? Uh, they often, you know, what we do in academia is we take a postdoc and we throw them again and hope they can figure out how to write a grant, hope that they can figure out how to teach. And that adds uh, a lot of uncertainty but I think we, we as an academia, if we had more structured professional development and training programs at the grad and postdoc level, we could really um, begin to open up this bottleneck. I think it's gonna be a multifactorial thing, but I think this is one of the first things we could do to really boost the number of faculty members. Um, and you know, at, at UW, we have a program, Emil was talking about how to support students uh, when they come in, and we do that, we've got a lot going for undergrads, uh, but I think we need more, much more for grads and postdocs. We have stuff for faculty and undergrads, but we've got to do the same, the same energy and effort into grads and postdocs so that we smooth that part of the pathway also. And so those would, coming in as a new dean, that's going to be some of my first focus areas. I think I see uh, Ken there. Um, you know, so, you know, how do we get, is the question of how do we attract more um, black faculty to our respective institutions? Um, and there's a variety of ways we can think of, including as one I mentioned before, which is uh, putting faculty of color in charge of search committees and resourcing them uh, and rewarding them for amplifying the pool of uh, diversity of the pool of people of uh, underrepresented minorities that are considered and encouraging them to message 
that uh, they, the search, it's not healthy to have a very narrow search intellectually or scientifically. It's healthier to just keep a broad perspective and look for people that'll improve your community, period, in many ways. Down the road, you're talking about tenure review, we need to put into place a messaging and a clear messaging that um, black faculty who have spent a lot of time on diversity, inclusion, equity, um, improving a sense of belonging, they've created a situation in which that's also amplifying greatly the mission of the institution uh, to train people to go out and make productive impacts on society. It's They've done a lot to improve the mission of the success of the research and the education. And that has to be valued in the tenure review process. We have to get away from this counting bean counting where everybody's subject to the exact same bean counting formula. You have to get away from that. But at the same time, you do want to mentor. You have to understand that the faculty who also, they wanna do that, but they do wanna build a scientific portfolio. So how do you support that? One of the faculty in yesterday's brought up, uh, maybe a couple of them, that uh, they get uh, black faculty get their NIH grants uh, unscored or not funded more frequently. And there was a discussion a little bit there about whether that was uh, due to racism or, or not. And then somebody brought up the point that when you sit on, on a review panel, which I have, uh, I know many of you have as well, if, if, if there's somebody in that panel willing to champion that grant, that grant can be terrible and still get funded because of the way the dynamics of a study section is. So what's really might be happening here is they haven't been able to create the network over the old boys network and they don't have the advantage of that. And so their name, their thing comes through. Nobody knows this person, whether they certainly may not know if they were a person of color or not, but nobody knows this person, never heard of this person. There's nobody there willing to champion that grant. It's not, they have networks. So there has to be a top down way to mentor this process to get your faculty that have served on, on these committees to deeply commit time to getting this person more networked and to getting their grant prepared in a way that tries to over, overcome this hurdle. I'll stop there. I think Steve was uh, next. Yeah, I'll just add a couple of things because I think both uh, Nancy and Ken touched on, on some things and so I'll just add in. I think this is, at least for us, this is one place where all the incredible hard work hasn't yet, it, um, I would say it's, um, it's materializing, but not in the way that most most people want. So, and this is a place where absolutely leadership matters. It matters from our office, it matters from the chairs, and just kind of you know little bits of data, 60% of the new faculty that we hired this year will be women underrepresented minorities. But guess what? Not a single black um, new professor will be coming. So we failed miserably on black, uh, on re recruiting uh, black scholars to, 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 to campus but making very, very good progress. And really this is where it sits at the, you know, at the school and um, recruitment committee. So again, a lot of the best practices that, that we talked about. I think the best practice that people haven't mentioned that we absolutely have to break. Um, some of you might be familiar, my colleague, Charles Isbell, who's the Dean of the College of Computing has done a study where he looks at the, in, in, this is in computer science, but he looks at where the institutions that um, they recruit from um, and, and frankly, you know, it's it's elitist, and I don't mean that about him. I mean about academia as a whole. That the institutions that we go look for for candidates um, is is frankly elitist. And how it is we expand that pool well beyond just the top ten or top fifteen institutions. And the data is really astounding when you look at top engineering programs uh, and you look and see where those where those candidates, underrepresented minority candidates, come from. They come from elite institutions, and we need to expand. Um, our view on um, on the institutions that we recruit from, and so that's a that's you know an, uh, an, a one more best practice that we're going to be implementing, and it takes a tremendous amount more work. Um, but again, because of the success we've seen, we, we've seen the cultural changes where where our chairs and our faculty search committees are beginning to to spend that energy, whereas they weren't real uh, they weren't a couple of years ago. So Matt, please. Yeah, thanks. Um... Uh, it's kind of a complicated thought I'm trying to get out, and it goes back to elitism and, and some of the things we've been talking about or brought up earlier. But um, I, 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 since we're in charge of schools of engineering, I think we really have to worry about getting a, a more diverse faculty into 
our, our, our faculty cohorts. But uh, going back to something Ken said much earlier, um, I, I think there is a kind of a, a weird danger of uh, transmitting to students at an earlier stage that becoming a professor is really the <laughs> crowning achievement of somebody's professional life. Why not a doctor <laughs> or uh, a, you know a great industrial engineer? And of course, like I'm not, I'm not negating what we're talking about, which is getting great people into universities. But maybe if we didn't convey that attitude that you know we are trying to prof train professors, which you know we don't totally. I, I think it's a, it's a little more subtle than I'm portraying right now, but. Um, you know, we, we could excite people about engineering education because of all the possibilities and then, you know, work on making uh, the job of an assistant professor more attractive by helping them network and, and things like that. Part of what I'm, I'm saying, you know, comes from, I, I'm now on the board of directors of a small foundation called the Camille and Henry Dreyfus Foundation, which supports chemists and chemical engineers. And for a long time, we gave grants to the American Chemical Society for scholarships for black undergraduate students. And almost all of those students went to medical school. So it didn't, it didn't have the effect of producing more chemists than chemical engineers, but it got them where they wanted to go. So anyway, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know how you distilled down what I'm talking about into into good advice, but uh, making our whole profession <laughs> seem more fun and more attractive and more opening up is, is something I think we should shoot for. So we, uh, there's another question from the audience that ties into uh, a question that Ruha and, and I had, and it deals with some of the institutional sort of structural constraints and legal constraints, right, that may exist. Um, they can make it difficult to maybe implement certain really uh, innovative or creative ideas or initiatives that target Black students, Latinx students, Indigenous students. Are there, can you share a little bit about that um, with, because I think that is not really prominent and something that um, many students, uh, many uh, in the public are aware of, that there are just some challenges that you have to carefully navigate in order to have a, a certain level of success. So could you please t talk to speak to that? Uh, Nancy, please. Yeah, so I can speak to it at, in the state of Washington. We have a law called I-200 that effectively uh, pro prohibits us from considering race and eth ethnicity and admissions decisions. And uh, there's a move to change this, but nevertheless, it's not changed. Uh, and so, you know, one of the things about this is it has forced us to really think about what kind of students succeed. And maybe we admit the students holistically based on their entire package. So again, it's get rid of this whole ACT, SAT kind of thing. Uh, that's not so useful at all, but look at the entire person. And so in order, we have to be careful uh, as we work to make sure we grow the diversity of the student population at UW. But in a good way, it's forces us to think deeply about what makes a great engineer. And it's not really grades and test scores to be quite honest. It's innovation, it's creativity, it's motivation. And now when we look at the student's package, we try and have a, a better, more holistic approach. So in a way it's, it's while we hate the law, we wanna see it changed. Uh, it has forced us to think more deeply about what makes a good engineer so that we can change the way we view students and admit them um, and, and get, you know, continue to build diversity at the University of Washington. Uh, anyone, I, I actually know I-200 quite well. Uh, it came into law uh, at the end of my first year. Uh, I actually was a social activist before I was a scholar, uh, to be honest. And Prop 209, the 
I believe the regents in California just voted or not had a conversation. They basically said, so I-200 for all those who do not know in the audience, uh, I-200, Initiative 200 was based off of Prop 209. We actually had war, we actually had Connerly came up to Seattle to lead a lot of conversations around this. Uh, and I think the regions I just heard recently acknowledged that that was a mistake. The fact that they're not considering race and ethnicity in a lot of decisions, whether it was admission into their graduate programs or law school or the hiring practices, they basically said it was a mistake that we made well over 20 years ago. This was like 1995 that it was voted in California. Uh, so it actually does my heart well that Initiative 200 is being discussed as possibly you know something to possibly repeal. But we have to be able to use every tool that is at our disposal um, in order to move this forward. So I just wanted to touch on that. And that's actually how um, I got really involved when I was at University of Washington and a lot of the DEI sort of activities that were going on while I was a graduate student. Uh, but anyone else like to, to speak to that? Is any, any other sort of structural uh, barriers that may exist? If not, I have an, another question that we could ask. I'll just, if it's okay, just really quickly, it, it feels, uh, feels less structural and legal and, and more cultural because I think, I, I, I'm sure I speak for, for my colleagues, we all have aspirations to have a more diverse faculty, to have a more diverse student population. And we're, we are constantly uh, reminded to be careful with the language we use. And that's just being really honest, you know, to, to, to stay away from quotas, to stay away from targets, to stay whatever. Because I think I can certainly speak for myself, you know, having a faculty that accurately models the student body that we have and that the community we live in is a priority. It's, a, it's, a, it's one of our values. And yet how we communicate that, um, we're constantly reminded to be, to be careful around that. Um, we, we may be not constrained by the same laws that, that are in California and the University of Washington, but I think we are cognizant of you know, the language that we use, even though our aspirations, uh, we think are very, very clear. Thank you. I'm just um, I'm going to let Sharon go and then I'm going to um, pose a question that's come up in a number of ways in for the audience. Um, and I'll so I'll pose it now and then just let Sharon, Sharon say whatever you were planning to say. Um, and so it's that it feels that most of the responses are part of our conversation are putting most of the work on the small number of faculty uh, of color in terms of this work. So those faculty have come to the university to do their STEM work. How can we incentivize white faculty to take up this work? So Sharon, please. Yeah, I wanted to follow up on, on Steve's comment um, specifically about quotas because all of us have been told you cannot mention that. And that's certainly even, so we're pushed to establish goals. And that was one of the previous questions. What are you gonna do within one, two and three years? But well, we certainly can't have quotas. I think one of the conversations there that surprised me was with a, one of our recent graduates who tremendous student uh, leader, just the, the ideal student um, made the comment, well, the black students feel as if we're, we were part of a quota and we don't deserve to belong here. And so I think we really have to all reach out and make sure that all our students know that they all belong there. They all earn their spot there. And, um, and, like many of you, there are state laws in Texas that really limit the ability of us to consider diversity and admissions. Um, so the students who are there are there because they, they fully deserve to be there. there. There aren't any extra, any buttons we can push. Yeah, before we, uh, before you all respond to Ruha's, uh, uh, the question from the audience, I, I just wanna add that um, there still remains the sentiment uh, and I actually wrote this note down this morning that faculty of color or students of color are only there because of their skin color. Um, I've actually been told that um, by someone else just in passing that it was said of me. Uh, there's this idea of uh, uh, this uh, stereotype threat is real. Uh, the notion of imposter syndrome looms large for the students. 
uh, and to some extent, some of the faculty of color as well as staff. And so if you, you have this feeling that that's how everyone views you, it does feel particularly hostile and impersonal. And it can really, really be difficult uh, for one to decide uh, on their own to actually remain in that environment. And so, you know, this touches on the question from the audience, how to get the faculty to help sort of provide cues and signals and not just the faculty of color uh, uh, to advocate and champion, support the students so that they can thrive, that they can be successful, that they can feel welcome. So that it gets become cultural as Steve has mentioned already, you get to this cultural transformation, right? And you almost have to sign a sort of incentivize that, but also sort of prep, prepare the faculty in order to do that and sort of embrace that. And that's what I would, I would definitely include that Tyrone in the kind of white noise that I was describing earlier. And, you know, the, the science and technology studies scholar Langdon Winner, he said all technical activity has a tendency towards forgetfulness. And so what I, it, it signals to me is that a historical literacy, it needs to be part of the training so that one of the very first things you can begin to do to chip away at that particular genre that, that, that you described in terms of people's, the culture in which people don't feel like they belong is to educate our students about the long history of white affirmative action. That in fact, it's not simply about everyone deserving to be there, that for generations, many people have given, been given an undeserved leg up. And that persists in the practices of homophily in which people mentor those people who seem like them, similar to them. The hidden curriculum in which met, a lot of knowledge is passed on implicitly. And so, you know, it, to be able to chip away at that, it's not just simply about being nice to students of color, but educating all students and faculty about why the demographics are the way that they are. And all of a sudden you realize that 20 odd years of very um, weak affirmative action policies have nothing to compare to however many hundreds of years of uh, true affirmative action, <laughs> true racial preference. So, yeah. I mean, as a student, when you realize that the question would be is why do white students actually feel that they deserve to be there? Why do they feel that sense of entitlement? It's not, it doesn't have any precedent in history on why they should. So that's what a much more fundamental reckoning that isn't just about making students of color feel good, but educating everyone, faculty included, about why things are the way they are. Nancy, please. Yeah, so this is more um, on a personal level than on the higher level of, of education, which I completely agree with Ruha. But I, I had epiphany years ago, and that is I, and a lot of us do this in, in the sciences, we tend to focus on telling people when they do something wrong, or we just don't say anything. And then I, I realized that a lot of people um, didn't often realize because of the imposter syndrome when they had done a really awesome job. And so I've, I now bend over backwards with everyone to say, to make more even-handed comments and to always point out to students wow, that was a great idea, or wow, that experiment was so well designed. And I, I still remain surprised that they often completely did not realize it. And so trying to give all this repetitive, I mean, feedback uh, of high quality and tell people when they're succeeding, and it can really make all the difference in the world. Um, and it just, up, it raises up morale too. So in my personal interactions, I now really try and do this um, and change the way scientists and engineers are interacting with people on a daily level. Uh, Ken? A couple of thoughts that I had. First, going back to the, the question that we originally asked. Uh, um, this is a big challenge about <clears throat> if, 
if you were as an institution, you say, you know, we want to be divert, respect diversity and inclusion and equity and so forth. And we're going to just make sure all of the black faculty and black grad students and black undergraduate students work towards enhancing that, um, outsourcing this to the, to, to, it's, it's just a terrible way to message real su sustainable change. And, uh, and so you've got to really think carefully and thoughtfully about who do you want involved in this, in the DEC, uh, in DEI initiatives so that it looks and sincerely is coming, is something that comes out of uh, an integrated group, not just the very group that you're concerned about. And, it, it, and so um, we've discussed it with you. You know, I have an assistant dean for outreach and diversity. She's a black woman, but very often I'm the one sending out, um, or I and the chairs are sending out memos related to activities and initiatives and so on um, to avoid some of this perception. Um, the other thing is, you can you could resource not just the black faculty who wants to work on DEI mentoring and initiatives that the resources are available to white faculty that want to work on these things as well if they're planning the idea and the, and the program is going looks like it could have a significant impact uh, and I and I your last comment Ruhar, is it's a, it's a much deeper and a pervasive comment about the way that uh, um, not only have policies been put into place which enhance the advantage but um, the lack of pursuing new policy is itself, uh, cause, you know, to, to, you mentioned the lack of affirmative action. By avoiding creating new policy, you, take, you get to take advantage of the existing policy. That's what I want to say. Uh, Sharon, please. <clears throat> so one of the things that I realized from, through the faculty recruitment process and by having the diversity statements was how much, uh, the, the entire, almost the entire population of people applying for faculty positions thinks diversity, equity, inclusion is important. And many of them talked about personal experiences where they felt the imposter syndrome, right? Maybe they came from a lower socioeconomic background and then they were, uh, when they went to college, they were felt out of place. So it's not the same as the, um, the being a black student but they, they, they understood the feeling to some extent and they wanted to do something to, to make it better. So I think your question, um, at least what I'm seeing, especially in our young faculty is they wanna make a difference and it's something that's important to them. And so that was, by asking them to write those diversity statements, it was the first time I had the opportunity to talk with them about it. And I, it really helped me put things in perspective and I, I, I see a very positive trend from this. My, you know, my comment was going to be really the same as, as the one that Sharon made, because I think for the exact same reasons, I think we're seeing more and more the earlier career faculty really seeing this as a part of their career. Um, obviously, not just uh, not just faculty of color, um, all, all faculty. So I'm, I'm hopeful along those lines. But yet I'm still, you know, we do we do. Um, you know, um, unconscious bias. We, uh, we're doing allyship. Um, you know, workshops and training, we're doing sexual harassment workshops and training. And so we, we we're willing to invest uh, in these things. Um, and I'm, I'm questioning whether they're having any impact at all. Um, I think they're having some impact, but in the end, I think it is, it really comes down to the people that we bring in um, and making sure at all levels, deans, de uh, department heads, faculty, that it's a, uh, that it's a top level priority. And again, I'm hopeful because I think we are seeing those, but those kinds of changes are take place on a generational level, not on a yearly level. And I think that's what I'm struggling with is, you know, what are, because we do have the resources to get in front of faculty to, 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 uh, to raise awareness about uh, the kinds of things that, that Ruha brought up, but you know, how do we do that? Or, or what are those resources? We need to know what they are um, and bring them to bear. So I, we have now hit uh, <laughs> just past an hour and a half. 
Um, this has been a very stimulating conversation. Uh, I think a very constructive and productive conversation. I want to thank you all, uh, Dean Terrell, Dean Luchin, Dean Alberton, uh, Dean Wood, uh, Dean McLaughlin, uh, former uh, Executive or Assistant Vice President uh, Bill Petrie, who's here with us, as well as Ruha, uh, for participating in this conversation. I want to finish out with just mentioning, right, in sort of a rehash here, some of the major takeaways um, that I just want to share with everyone uh, that's in the audience. And a lot of it dealt with um, coming up with uh, funding, funding, funding actually hit the mark multiple times. I heard from multiple people, we have to be able to fund any of these ideas so that they are sustainable. Um, incorporating diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts and activities into hiring, into promotion, and tenure review, and dossiers, into annual performance review, such that it becomes a sort of an expectation that this is just part of your job. This is something that you're expected to do as a faculty member in, in academia. Uh, constructive partnerships with HBCUs and minority service, so historically black colleges and universities, and minority serving institutions, and sort of constructive, productive partnerships uh, where there could be potentially some back and forth, whether it's through exchange programs uh, or sharing of ideas. Um, I think that's something that could be extremely um, productive and, and powerful. Um, but I think there, I got the sense from the entire committee and, and um, from the questions that there's a realization uh, that it's gonna take time and a lot of effort and commitment at all levels in order to be successful in this. Uh, and so once again, I wanna thank you all for the time that you have uh, invested uh, your dedication is very obvious to me that there's a lot of dedication and commitment uh, to this on, on your part. And I look forward to continuing this conversation with you all in the future, right? Uh, so thank you all for those who have joined in. Now, uh, I also just want to finish out with anyone uh, that's on the current panel, the deans, that wants to remain because we're going to have this town hall conversation about you know, prospective potential solutions uh, to this problem. You're very welcome to remain. You're very welcome to participate. Uh, Jennifer Singh from Georgia Tech is going to moderate that panel. Uh, Ruha, I don't know if you have any parting words that you wanna share uh, with everyone. No, I'm good. You, you speak for both of us. Thanks, Tyra. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so I turn it over to, I think Jennifer and or uh, one, uh, Amanda, uh, who are uh, is helping the staff and run this. Thank you. Thank you, Tyron. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name's Jennifer Singh, and um, we're transitioning now to um, really the last section of this fabulous panel uh, conference, two-day conference um, that addresses, you know, where do we go from here? disruptive actions to abolish anti-Black racism in STEM. And um, we um, will have joining with us uh, the moderators from each of the panel sections, including Ruha Benjamin, um, Simone Douglas, um, Al Nelson, Manu Platt, R uh, Ravana uh, Popoff, and Tyrone Porter. And so all of us here are um, um, join as well as many of the panelists who were also part of earlier sessions. Um, I just, it's been a really interesting couple of days. I work in the School of History and Sociology here at Georgia Tech. And um, I think I was invited to, um, and I focus on medical sociology and science and technology studies, but I think I was asked to be part of this conversation because my first career was in biotechnology and biomedicine before I sort of did a 180 to really start critically thinking in a sociological way around issues of how we produce knowledge is shaped by some of the, the values that we place into what we think might be important. Um, you know, uh, queries for uh, investigation. And um, 
So I really hope um, that many of you have had the opportunity to listen to uh, yesterday in today's conversations. Um, there's been many different contours of structural racism that have um, been illuminated. Um, and so the goal for this next hour and a half is just to really begin to think about how we can uh, move forward with explicit action items. Um, many of the panelists have emphasized, especially the graduate students, um, this unique moment that resides at the intersection of COVID-19 and, and the unequal impact this has had on um, Black communities throughout the United States, the long-standing racial trauma and violence um, from police brutality, and you know this raised consciousness of structural racism in the United States. I and mean, it really offers, I think, educational institutions a unique opportunity um, to move forward through what some of the panelists and the title of this whole conference is referring to as disruptive action. And so I want us to really start thinking about what this actually means and um, you know, what are tangible solutions on how we might begin to accomplish this type of action. Um, and so um, one of the things that um, um, I did is just start thinking about all the different panels that we listened to um, and what some of the main um, um, themes have been from the administrators, from the graduate students, from the faculty, and now we just heard from the deans um, who are all working in the world of engineering and some more broadly in STEM. Um, so I just want to highlight some things that stood out for me um, and then also bring unanswered questions. Lots of folks are participating on the uh, lives um, uh, YouTube and um, I want to make sure some of those questions are being addressed as well. Um, and the last 30 minutes, hopefully we can get to some new questions that might um, be coming in as we stream this now. Um, so from the panel of African Americans of higher uh, education administrators working in the world of, of STEM, these are some of the things that I heard. You know, there's more bias in education than any other industry. Diversifying STEM is activism each and every day. Um, representation at every level of the enterprise really matters. And if you don't see yourself in your environment, you may feel that this environment is not the one for me. Um, you want to be on the right side of the curve, and in order to do this, you must be prepared. And there's lots of different ways in which we've been talking about levels of preparedness. Diversity and inclusion is not a quote unquote add on, it's an asset that should be integrated throughout. I've heard this several times. Um, allies can ask questions like, what can we do, um, and how can we get involved? And then um, anti affirmative action really needs to stop. Um, Felicia Benton Johnson from Georgia Tech ended, you know, with a reasonable request. Um, I felt she said, you know, you need to utilize those who really have, who are in these positions that are already doing this work. You know, she states, we are black, we have the experience, bring us to the table and give us the resources to really implement the programs and the initiatives to meet diversity, equity and inclusion goals. Um, and so one of the questions from the audience um, that I wanted to pose to um, our moderators, as well as all the folks who have joined in this discussion, um, how do we create an environment to address less prepared students without attaching stigma to identifying them as such? Um, and how do we encourage students to use these programs when we actually have them? Because I think we see a lot of really good work, but maybe not all students know about them or are, uh, would like to participate. Yes, I, I see Manu's hand. Yes, yeah, so thanks Jennifer for that wonderful summary. Again, love the lens in which you, which, with which you view this. Um, this. This interesting thing about underprepared students, um, as some of the audience know, I run an actually high school research program where we take in students from Atlanta Public Schools, which as a school system, one would say is underperforming compared to the other local school districts. Um, we take these black students, we have them work in Georgia Tech labs and we actually pay them to do this. And what is always so interesting is when we hear from their mentors, their graduate student postdoc mentors that many of them are not black because of the grad student population that are always surprised at how dedicated these students are, what they're mm -hmm. able to learn and the hard work that they put in. And especially when the mentors really become close with the students, they also find more out about their home life and background and are shocked that what is normal to these students 
would seem like this aberration to the mentors and how can they work through this? And I think that's a lesson of this quote, underprepared students, it's about what is opportunity, right? Or luck is where opportunity meets preparation. And even if there's less preparation, there are young people out there that they know the standard and we and will jump to meet that standard. And one way we've been able to get successes out of our students is we had to tell the mentors, hey, hold the students to an expectation and mm -hmm. they will meet the expectation. Hold the expectation, help them get there and they will meet it. And it really became a difference than lowering the expectations for the students because then you only got that lower bar. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a mindset change that you can reach people and raise them up no matter where they're from. If they wanna do it, and a lot of these young people do, they will jump to meet that standard. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I saw Tyron's hand up. Yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> Manu and I both are products of HBCUs. That is an HBCU culture that if I've ever heard one, right? You get there and you're, you're immediately informed what the expectation is, regardless of what your skin color is, what your background is. And that is not, I would say exactly true within the hallways at a lot of the predominantly white institutions. And so I think it is a bit of a cultural change. And um, the former Dean, uh, so in the last panel, Dean Luchin at Boston University, uh, the senior does capstone project, uh, um, senior capstone uh, assignment for the biomedical engineering students is for them to actually do this research project. And he always tells the story of years ago uh, there was a question of whether they were going to be able to rise to the occasion and actually perform. And he said, if you let, if you give them an expectation, mm -hmm. you inform them what the ex expectation is up front, you give them the time, they will be successful. And that needs to be uh, pervasive. That needs to be part of the inherent culture within all of these classrooms, mm -hmm. within all of these departments, that you do have an expectation. Mm -hmm. But then uh, Man Manu makes a very good point, important point, that you also have to support them, right? You have to be able to support them and give them uh, some of the tools and techniques and maybe even guide them uh, and, and, and advise them that, you know, if there's something that you need tutoring on, it's going to be in your best interest. Uh, if you need to come to my office, send me an email. We'll schedule a time. I will be here for you in order to help you get through this material in order to get these fundamental concepts so that you can be successful. So you have to have the expectation, but also provide them with the academic support uh, in order for them to be successful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. I think I saw Elle's hand and then um, Emil. Yeah, I'll just, com I'll just comment that um, uh, one of the uh, programs that uh, one of my uh, teaching professor colleagues has uh, tried out was to develop a companion course for that freshman year or freshman quarter of general chemistry. And I, I spoke yesterday about this uh, performance gap that exists uh, between uh, underrepresented minority students and uh, their peers of equal uh, academic standing coming into the course. And uh, you know this, this companion course made a big difference in closing that gap. Uh, but what's, what was also important about um, rolling this out was that um, this was optional, right? So this was provided as an opportunity for those students who felt like, hey, you know, maybe maybe I could use this and, you know, creating this, this cohort uh, for a class, um, you know, could be something that I want. And, you know, there were more students who were interested in that companion course than there was space for. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think in addition to holding students at higher expectation, I, I think, you know, the, these students are also motivated. They, they want to do well. And so we should provide those opportunities too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, Emil? Yes, regarding the issue of uh, stigma, um, mm -hmm. at the University of Washington, we've been at this um, for 40 some years, mm -hmm. providing academic support to students. And up until 2000, there was a stigma associated with it. And black students um, are most sensitive about this and will avoid seeking support. But what happened is the uh, Costco offered scholarships to a few high achieving students. And all of those students flocked to our instruction center to get academic support. 
not to avoid failing, but to maximize the academic performance. And since then, we are, have been overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. We see 2,000 students a year, and we could see 3,000 if we had the staff and the space to do it. So we've had a model. It's considered the best in America. And when I mentioned that yesterday, I wasn't bragging. And like they say in the hood, we're not macking, we facking. <laughs> yes, Ravana. Yeah, the other side of it is, I think um, we don't talk about all the majority students who are not just seeking help, but demanding help. And no one you know, really talks about that. And so I think when I talk with students of color, particularly African-American students, one of the things I'm letting them know is that majority students are knocking on my door saying, I need to get an A and you need to tell me how I can get an A. And if those resources aren't in place, you are failing me. Mm. And so there's a sense of entitlement um, from certain students that I try to really enforce with students of color that I'm working with to say, they're making demands, that's the difference. Somebody has made you think that you can't make demands. These other students are making demands and that's why they're performing at a higher level. It's not even always that they're coming in with more, mm -hmm. right? But there's this sort of expectation that's there. And even in terms of, we were talking about teaching evaluations in the previous panel and how they sometimes hurt a faculty of color. But what I see, I review all of the teaching evaluations um, and I've seen it in other departments. Often what you see when a student's not doing well, it's the faculty member's fault, right? Mm -hmm. But students of color internalize with the help of other people, right? So it's not just, oh, students of color, you know, messages are being given consistently. And at various points in my career, I've had to talk with colleagues who assume because um, the program is offering academic support or because it's targeted primarily to first generation or students of color. Oh. <clears throat> and that's what, how they go into interactions with those students and those students hear it or they feel it even if it's not said overtly. Um, but yeah, that's something I, I really try to unveil for students of color. Don't buy it. There are lots of students who are struggling and they struggle for different reasons. The difference is who makes a demand that they should be doing better and you need to put resources in place for that and who just sort of accepts that perhaps it's their fault and they're not doing well and who kind of hears that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think you bring up a really important point, um, something that came up yesterday when I was reviewing my notes is just kind of that internalized racism in many ways that people experience that they're not good enough or that they don't, you know, that their question, that they should know the answer, that they don't, that they shouldn't even be asking that question because they should already know the answer. Um, it can be very problematic in trajectories of these careers in, in, in graduate school and beyond, in undergraduate school, graduate school uh, and beyond. Um, did anybody else have a response? Um, there was lots more questions um, that I want to move forward. Um, one of the uh, other, big themes that came out in, in I think all of the panels was this sense of wanting a community, a sense of wanting some place to belong, looking, just listening to students talking about, you know, their experiences um, at historically black colleges um, and universities and going to a predominantly white institute and how, you know, having a nurturing environment at all different levels and then shifting and transitioning to being the only one right, um, whatever, at whatever intersection you identify with um, and not having those kinds of communities. Um, the uh, administrative panel talks, talked about their students saying, you know, students of color want to be seen as whole people. They're serious, they wanna thrive. They don't wanna be singled out by being only black. Students need to feel a sense of belonging. And then there's a lot of ways in which students are hurt from um, different kinds of interactions that they have at a lot of different levels. And so, um, you know, one question that came up um, from um, the audience, um, this is a student, a future student, uh, she or he stated, I will be starting a PhD program this fall and as such, we'll be meeting a new group of peers. What are things that I can do and things I can encourage my cohort to do to be positive influence to destructing systemic racism in STEM? I have some thoughts around that. Hey, Jennifer, nice hey, to see you. I know. <laughs> um, 
So, um, and I'm, I'm going to have my screen on and off just because I've been on the screen all day. So, um, so first, before I provide some reflection on that, I just want to also just say as someone who went to an HBCU, one of the things I have to tell my students now at a predominantly white university is it's not all hunky dory <laughs> that in many ways um we're sold a uh, mythology around um a different world <laughs> which is why i went there <laughs> um <laughs> but when you hit the ground you realize oh there's all kinds of fault lines and divisions and hierarchies and status seeking that often don't even have the chance to surface in predominantly white settings because you gotta have to band together, um, but it all comes out. Mm -hmm. And so, um, for example, many of my friends, my first year at Spelman were so disillusioned that what they were promised of the sisterhood was not reality that people dropped out or didn't come or took a leave of absence. So I just wanna also just put a little pin in that and bust that bubble um, but not to say that it's bad, but to say that the same kind of work you have to put in at a predominantly white institution to build your community, to build your squad, you also have to do that at HBCUs. It doesn't just come gift wrap to you. And so I feel like telling my students that, that that was my experience at an HBCU, one lets them realize that, wow, if you had to put in work at a school that was built for black women, then maybe that means I have to put in work in this space that was definitely not built for me. Mm -hmm. So once you just reorient yourself in turn away from the consumer model, model of education, which is give me what I paid for, <laughs> like, you know, it needs to be gift wrapped and packaged and put in my lap, you realize, oh no, I have to create my squad, which brings us to the question, and it is the right question, but it's a question that you have to ask no matter where you are, no matter where you work. You might have to put in more work, in a slightly more work in a predominantly white setting, but you have to put in work to create your quality. And I think my experience as a grad student at Berkeley was really amazing in that my cohort from the skip, from, from day one, we, we were very deliberate about creating a collaborative cohort, not competitive. So even when we were technically competing for fellowships, let's say, we created our, our situation where we exchanged essays, we can exchange and gave each other feedback. We know where we were competing for this extra, but we were gonna work together. And if people didn't get it the first year, they were going to be on, they will be on the, you know, learn from that and reapply the next year. But you, in some ways you have to identify and then, uh, you know, subvert the competitive ethos, the individualistic ethos. And if it, if the people around you in your particular cohort aren't with it and they really don't, they're just going to do what they're going to do, then you might have to work with people outside. And that's also what now what I see happening at Princeton where you know, we don't have a PhD program in African American studies, but students across the university can get a certificate in it. Well, what that means is they create a cohort outside of their discipline with each other to have each other's back. So, so, so all I will just say to the person asking the question is you, you have to be very deliberate about it and you don't need a whole lot of people. <laughs> you don't need a, you don't need like all the friends. You just need a crew of people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, but, and I think, so then the last question I'll put on the table is what is the responsibility of faculty in creating that environment? Because mm -hmm. it's not, yes, we want to encourage students, but for me, what I do very deliberately is the students that I advise, I don't advise them individually. I also help cultivate a community. So like right now, all my thesis students are meeting regularly over the summer and, and supporting each other and working together. So I think also setting the expectation as faculty that we're in this together. We're going to get through this together. <laughs> and, um, and once they know that you got to where you are, not because you are so brilliant all by yourself, but because you had a squad behind you. You have that group text that's encouraging you right now. That, you know, all along the way that we are all here because we have a whole village of people pushing us. Once we make that visible to our students, it destigmatizes then their 
desire and need to create that as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ruha. That's really important um, points that you're making there. Um, I did see Monica raise her hand. Did you want to add to that? Yes, and what I'll say um, and add to what Ruha, uh, the advice that Ruha gave is, you know, I would encourage students when they are seeking out that cohort, that group of people that literally is going to take this academic journey with them to show up as your authentic self. Don't put on airs, right? Don't try to be someone who you aren't, but show up as your authentic self, whoever that may be. Because if you're looking for your tribe, your squad, your group, you are going to attract the people who appreciate you and cherish you for who you really are and not someone that you pretend to be. So show up as your authentic self. Mm -hmm. Great. Absolutely. I just, um, I just wanted to chime in here, um, especially since um, I was just a student. I'm, as I said yesterday, I am in that transition period from PhD student to postdoc right now. And <laughs> I, I do want to put out here, put out there that it is it is important for you to create your community, but also understand that your community can evolve over time as you're there, especially as new students come into your spaces. Mm -hmm. And I found that that's something that happened for me, particularly as more Black women were accepted and joined the program. And part of that reason was because there was very few Black women in our in our department um, for graduate students initially, and then once they saw how we came together, we have our wind down Wednesdays. You know, and they see us, and we actually actually ended up inviting them to a wine down Wednesday during recruitment, right? They saw us all there together. That's how we started getting more and more Black women into um, our department. And the nice thing is now that we have such a large group that there are subgroups within our group where more people can identify as as we have our little neuro squad now with with um, with with Black women who are mostly neuro. And it's not just we are no longer just Black women who were in the Black lab. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Dr. Platt's lab <laughs> over there laughing. Um, but I think it's really important to kind of in, embrace that because especially in my perspective is that, you know, I am a first generation American. My, my parents um, are Jamaican immigrants and just learning about the African diaspora and how there are just so many different black people out there in America and from different regions and just kind of embracing all of those experiences to grow your network and cultivate some of those communities. And mm -hmm. to the, to the last point, I think, um, someone was mentioning about having the financial support from, uni from the university in your department. And sometimes you do need to create a formal space that is recognized by the university to get that um, ownership and get that respect, if you will. And mm -hmm. that is something that uh, a couple of us um, students did. We talked about that a little bit yesterday, forming BEAM. Um, however, as when we were putting that together, you know, we do. We did hear back from the uh, the department chair and even the diversity and inclusion committee for the department, saying, "Yes, we recognize you and everything, but it's not just the financial commitment. It's also when we say we want a website, giving us access to the website. When we want meeting room space, giving us the meeting room space. When we say we want to joint ef join efforts together, join efforts together, but don't take out, don't take credit for something that we did, right?" So, you know, so just also be cautious of that for, for students who are definitely um, trying to create their own formal spaces at universities. You know, you, you put the work in, you, you definitely earn that credit and respect. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I also, um, it was good that, you know, Ruha sort of, you know, busted the, the bubble there a little bit in terms of how um, um, the illusion of community um, exist in um, historically black colleges and universities, but also the kind of work that is needed because I think there's something to learn here about the kinds, how we create community within our own universities. And so maybe there is something to learn. Um, and I'm surprised that maybe, and, and perhaps because um, HBCUs don't have engineering programs. I don't know why that is not represented on this panel today. And that's something to even think about in our own planning for you know, these kinds of discussions, especially as I learned yesterday that so many PhDs um, or so many um, PhD students come from these particular schools. I mean, our panel was sort of representative. Well, there are a few, Jennifer, just interrupt. There are a few like Prairie View, Howard, Hampton, those for sure have defined engineering programs. But they're not here. They're not right, part they're of not the here. conversation. Yeah, they're, not, they're not part of the conversation. Yeah, yeah, and, and maybe they should have been. 
um, something to think about just in our own practices of when we're organizing um, groups and discussions. Um, um, there, there were some questions just, you know, from people who are not black, whether they be faculty or students or, you know, people who want to be mentors, um, um, questions coming around, you know, um, non-black students are afraid of saying the wrong things when things show up for their black peers. Can uh, the panel talk about some attitudes, words, phrases, actions that are more harmful rather than more helpful? Um, and then I think this is related to something that Tobias was saying at the beginning of the conference yesterday and where there needs to be um, some type of really sort of um, systematic approach to really educating people about key terms and, um, and, and what they actually mean um, because um, we might get it wrong um, or the meaning might, might, might not be right. So I was wondering if anybody would like to speak to some of those questions. I'm always happy to jump in. Um, on you. Always. Um, it's just interesting about, and I think this came out in the Dean's panel and several other times. We've all had this space where people are like, or in my own faculty meetings about, I was scared to say something because I didn't want to say the wrong thing. And um, I just have a suggestion for those that want to be sure they say the right thing. Start earlier just going and hanging around Black people, right? Um, I think once you are around them more often, you will get out your snafus and errors and you will start to learn what you do. Like I have a number of incredibly wonderful white people that are friends of mine. And what makes it successful, especially is when they will come with me into an all black space and without fear, right? Or if there is fear, they will still come, right? I've had several who have said they would come and then when the times come to actually make the trip, they decide at the last minute, I can't make it, I'm sick, I'm whatever. And, and I think that's where you start to kind of get your tool set together. You go and hang around these spaces. If you trust me, I would not put you in a place that would put you in danger, right? So when you come around these people, the people that I will bring you around, you might say something crazy. They might bring it up to you that what you said was crazy. You learn a lesson, you move on from there. But I think the other thing that all of us in higher ed as black people, we have to do is go into spaces where we are the only one and we have to learn the norms of that space, mm -hmm. right? And, and as I mentioned yesterday, I, my, my lab, when I started my PhD was predominantly Korean. I was around Koreans quite a bit. I had to be sure that I, or learn what was appropriate to say or not to say around Koreans because it wasn't taught to me from the elementary school. And so those that really wanna learn, step out there. You have your one black friend, go with that black friend to a black space and join the community, have the conversations. I think that's when you start to learn how to say and what not to say. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I think your point um, being too, that how you've had to learn a new, you know, oftentimes, um, you know, I put myself included in that. You have to learn a new language um, when you're in a different space that you weren't acculturated in when you were growing up necessarily. Um, so, uh, other questions. So I wanted to finally end just um, with the first panel that talked last um, yesterday. They touched on issues of hiring diverse faculty. And so this is something um, that has been, you know, a, a major theme um, throughout this conference, making sure uh, diverse candidates are presented to the candidate constituencies. Faculty priorities in teaching should not be or should not take a back seat. Um, Recruiting faculty starts before you actually have an opening. So really identifying who's out there, what work people are doing, um, getting to know them. Um, and when we're developing faculty, we need to get it in early um, because of, of issues of not really knowing or fitting in a space, not having the mentors to help us with the tenure and promotion process and how we need sort of that development very early on. Um, one case question that came up, um, um, in, in yesterday's discussion from our audience was that um, they wanted to know, it would be nice to know what the Black or Latinx faculty representation is in STEM. I think we've heard some numbers, you know, it depends on how you count STEM or if you're looking just at engineering. So at these institutions, it's very different. Um, but I, I would imagine that the numbers and percentages are pretty low, you know, um, when we're looking at Black Latinx um, and indigenous populations, I would imagine even um, really low. Um, 
does anyone know off the top of their head, like in their in their in their field, what the percentage is? Um, for for black faculty, it's two and a half percent in STEM. For two and a half year. percent, just across the board. Uh, of, for STEM, black, of STEM, of STEM. Yeah. No, I'm telling you, it's like that across the board. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's not any. It's not much of any better in yeah, other fields. Yeah. Yeah, so. you're not cracking. You're not cracking ten percent. I think in any field, mm -mm, you know, I think mm -mm. you're rarely cracking five or six percent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what, what's even what's even more alarming, if I could, um, because this this becomes into a question of um, being in the room where it happened, being at mm -hmm. the seat and uh, having the seat at the table. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's even fewer that get promoted to full professor. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the reason why I bring that up is predominantly in higher education, the positions of power, the dean's level, the provost level, the president's level, those are full professors at PWIs at the very least. Almost never do you see an associate professor in that type of position. It does happen, but it's very rare. So mm -hmm. these are the people who allocate resources and right. set the priorities for the college and for the department. The faculty council can have a voice, but ultimately who controls the purse strings controls the organization. Mm -hmm. And who sets the priorities controls the organization. So we need to have more of us who get to that full professor level. And based on a paper that I found this morning, you know, we do get promoted and we do get tenure promoted to associate professor, but there, there is even smaller percentage that then get to the full professor level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Go ahead, Monica. Oh, oh Simone, go ahead. Okay. No, I, I do have to say that as a, a person who's aspiring to go into the academy one day, these numbers are like extremely disappointing and disheartening. I mean, I mean, just like think about it. I'm a freshly minted PhD student, you know, all bright eyed and excited. And then, <laughs> and then I go and I, and this is what I see. I'm pretty sure the first, um, Black faculty or professor who ever, I ever met was Dr. Platt, followed by Dr. Bochway immediately after, mm -hmm. right? We were all just happened to be in the same room and that was a surprise, right? But it just, it especially yesterday hearing the faculty discussions and also Dr. Platt has told me several times over the past five years about funding disparities. Of, you know, when you look at black faculty getting um, funding compared to non-black faculty members, the odds are greatly stacked against me. And I'm a woman on top of that, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, it's, it's just, if I were gambling, if I were in Vegas and gambling and I saw the hand that I, would, I had, would I be willing to take that bet? You know, no, but I mean, I'm, I am me. And of course, like I'm all in right now. I'm saying this, hire me. You're looking for someone down the line, hire me, all right? I'm starting a postdoc, right? And it was really disheartening at one point when I went to, um, I think it was the Institute on Teaching and Mentoring when I was talking, talking to someone and they said, yeah, you know, we're looking to hire um, talented faculty. And that was their response to hiring more diverse faculty. There are talented black scholars out there. There are talented Latinx scholars out there. You need to go out and actively seek that and not solely rely on that elitism as, as what was being talked about in the previous panel. Because unfortunately, not all of us are going to do postdocs at those higher or higher more elite level um, institutions likely because of institutionalized racism it might not be an environment we want to go into mm -hmm. and so we take a step back and we go to maybe a smaller school with an equally talented professor and advisor doing fantastic research and then when we go onto the faculty um, search and we start looking to, to start a position in academia right and we're looking at these higher schools they're, they, they're not necessarily wanting to, to talk to us, mm -hmm. right? And that, I will say that greatly influenced who I am working with for a postdoc and where I'm going for a postdoc. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, Tyrone. Yeah, um, so you make, you make exceptional points here, right? So one thing that uh, I guess I wanna bring up is not every PhD is gonna want to pursue an academic career. Mm -hmm. So that, that's sort of the first thing. It's, yeah. it's not 100%. Um, I don't know what the percentage is. It's probably not even 50%. At least in biomedical engineering, 
the vast majority, I, to be honest, I've graduated nine students and I've had a couple of postdocs, only one out of nine decided to pursue an academic career. Mm -hmm. uh, and it wasn't like I was a, a, a impersonal individual. It wasn't like I made my job seem exceptionally hard. Even though there's a lot that you have to do, they just wanted to pursue a, a career in, in corporate America. Uh, they wanted to do something that they felt like was going to be immediately translated and applied and would, would be something that would make uh, improve quality of life. That's what they wanted to do. Um, so that's the first thing I wanted to bring up. Uh, the second thing is certainly, <clears throat> I think the Dean spoke to this earlier, there needs to be more of us either on the search committee or our chairs of the search committee. Because I do think we have a better sense of where to find, how to cultivate and how to engage and interact those potential applicants. Uh, mm -hmm. Those who are from the sort of more of homogenous, sort of more of the elitist mindset, you know, they don't do as good a job. And so I do think it's important for us to be participating within those panels. The panels themselves and search committees need to be better educated. And there are efforts to do that. Um, but that that's the, the numbers sound daunting. The last thing I'll mention, because I saw Manu's hand and uh, I know he wants to share because he always likes to share is this is there's a I mentioned yesterday that I felt obligated to pursue this career. At the same time, I did do summer internships as an undergrad, and I knew I did not want to go to corporate America because mm -hmm. I felt like a lot of my intellectual curiosity would not, it will remain untapped. I really did feel like being a, co a college professor working in a university would allow me to really explore and utilize all of the intellectual capacity that I really, really, truly had and not worry so much about the bottom line being a product or a widget that could be sold. But once I got tenure, I do have the protection and the knowledge that I have a secure job. As long as I don't like strangle somebody out, choke somebody out, I have a secure job until I decide to retire. And that level, especially in today's age, as we've seen, you know, we are privileged. Let's be honest also about that. We are very privileged to still have jobs, still have a paycheck, right? To take care of ourselves and our loved ones. And you can't say that about anybody that's guaranteed unless you're a Supreme Court justice. Like that seat is there until they die or they decide to step down. And Aaron, can that. I jump in? Yeah. I wanna, I wanna jump the line. Manu, I'm gonna jump the line for a second because <laughs> it ties to, I mean, so both that word secure triggers um, a, a important conversation. And also the first part of your reflection around um, students looking at the professoriate as not a desirable career path. And so I would encourage us to put the abysmal diversity numbers next to the uh, very, very high and growing rate of um, contingent labor. Because that this conver I don't th so as we go back to our campuses and continue this, I think that that those don't need to, those can't be separate conversations. Because I personally, when I was finishing um, my PhD, I didn't. When I looked at my professors, that didn't look appealing to me at all. They looked overworked, underpaid. They just it looked toe up, and I was like, why am I going to do that? You know. And so that is not. Um, and it's not an individual issue. It's about the labor conditions of the academy. So we're having a conversation about diversifying a, a sinking ship, right? Let's get some more, you know, let's get some more of us into the Titanic, you know? And so I think we have to have this conversation. And, and in fact, someone early in the earlier panel posed the question, how do you see labor relations fitting into your diversity plans? Many of the workers in your schools are organized and have been making DEI related demands for literally over a decade. This was directed at the deans. Do you pledge to work with your organized workers? And so I would just encourage us to, to understand the, the way that this is intertwined, that um, a very small sliver of the professoriate has that security that you described, Tyrone. And so, um, and I don't, and I think 
basking in that privilege, um, the next step is really to um, say it's one of those privileges that shouldn't be monopolized, that we have to think about our conversation here in conjunction with the contingent labor in the, in the academy. So this is fantastic. And so, of course, by the way, Spell House Class of 2001 is representing on this panel with my sister, Ruha. And I'm, okay. Um, and you could always interrupt me, Ruha. Um, but it, you now made me add a little longer to what I was going to say, because you bring up another very interesting point. Um, so it's interesting, as I heard Tyrone talk about this security, and I remember speaking to one of my former graduate students, another Black woman who's postdoc in UCLA. I had to tell a real truth. I said, I feel like every day if I mess up at work, they'll fire me. Tenure or not, right? This is America. The rules can always change. And that's why I just have to try every day to not mess up. And she looked at that as, oh my God, that's a terrible way to come to work. Listen, that's how I was raised, right? I can't get comfortable or get settled. And that's how the majority of people in the world go to work. <laughs> exactly, right? And but so they, I can't think about that. Like that. Wait, 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 you gotta be finished, Sarah. you gotta be finished. Yeah. <laughs> I said, Ruha, I could interrupt me. <laughs> Um, but I, but the other point I wanted to come back to came from, I think it was either what uh, Dr. Douglas Green, which I love to call her these days, is I think the other interesting point is I came into grad school, is, is how many students who come into grad school, particularly Black students, wanting to be faculty and then decide in the process they don't. So when I was a graduate school at, school at Georgia Tech, there were so many actually Black grad students that were with me. A lot of them came and wanted to be a professor. I did not. I was going to go work for NASA. I had NASA scholarships and I'd been there. That was the dream. And then as we were getting near the end, each one kept saying, I'm out, I'm leaving, I'm out of this, I'm out. And I was like, what are you doing? We all wanted to have a black professor because at the time there were no black professors in my department. We all wanted one. And I was like, why are you all leaving? They're like, cause I'm not dealing with this. And it was not even seeing what the professor life was like, just what they had been through in the process of getting a PhD that said, I'm not a part of this system. And that's why I think we do lose a lot of students and particularly where we lose a lot of black women because black women are in the PhD programs a lot more than black men and they decide this is not for me. And so then in that process, they turned to me and said, why don't you do it? You seem happy. <laughs> and I was like, I'm going to NASA, like that's not going to work. And then blah, 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 I'm here, right? But I think that's another thing that the system has to get under its belt. How these students are treated, even in that first part of that process, that then they think, well, if I come back as this professor, number one, I might see how my professor is treated, as Ruha mentioned. And that really is not a life that why would I subject myself to this when I have all of these other choices afterwards? And I think that's where we lose a lot of students and that's where across the country, and that's what we all need to think about. How do we enrich these students' experiences during that PhD so that they get, like Tyrone said, the freedom and the joy. And, and again, the best part for me of being a professor is the free food and the free travel. Tell, tell people about that. And so I think we need to address that in the academy. Oh, and I want to say one more thing about the pay. Sorry, one more thing about the pay because we're going to the pay too. It was so interesting to me when I was a postdoc and I was getting ready to start negotiating my faculty job offer. And I heard from several other postdocs in the office. Oh, you know, professors don't make any money. Oh, they don't make any money. We do it for the love. Let me tell you something. When I got that first contract from my department chair, I said, I legit ran out of the building and was like hiding because I said, if he comes and sees me, he's going to take this contract from me. And I remember thinking about looking, going back to my postdoc office and be like, what do your families make that this is zero money? This is more money than anyone in my family has made. So what is this lie that we're talking about professors don't get paid? Again, maybe it just goes to show the wealth gap in America that I thought it was a lot of money and other people thought it was nothing. But that's a lie that we're still telling young people. But that was a tenure track job, right? A tenure track job, exactly. Yeah, so yeah. that's, yeah. The, that's yeah. partly what I'm, what the gap is not, is also between that track and everybody else. Yeah, Absolutely. But it also just shows right. that when you have someone that was around raised in a different setting and around different people, if you listen to the voices in the room and not see the evidence, you can be like, well, let me go and leave and go to this corporate job where they might lay me off every three months I'm at risk for it, as Tyrone mentioned, versus having this decent paying steady job if I do right. I'll leave it there. Yeah. yeah so you do have to do right. So what I will just add here, I worry more about not being able to pay the people that are in my laboratory. And in that case, I have to let them go. 
okay? Mm -hmm. I don't I don't worry about me getting let go. I worry about letting the people in my laboratory let letting them go. And that keeps me up pretty late at night. Mm -hmm. I usually don't lose sleep about losing my job. I lose sleep about having to tell somebody else you're fired. Mm -hmm. I think that's what I'm really just trying to share to the students who are here and Simone as well. It's hard to get there. And you do still have to put forth the work and the effort to maintain the job. But we all know a lot of faculty are terrible teachers, haven't brought in a grant in years, and are probably still walking around the hallways. And it's like, how in the world are you still walking around the hallways? And how many black professors do we know like that? There's not that many black. I'm not, how, many of, <laughs> That's how, all many I'm us, how many of us get to full professor level? Because many of them who are doing that are full professors. So we need to have more of us that also get to the full professor level in order to do that. But I do agree. It, it, it's something that is not guaranteed. But it's certainly I don't lose sleep at night about losing my job. I lose sleep about having to fire somebody because I wasn't able to bring in the money to pay them. I think one thing that's really important um, and that came up yesterday and it's part of this conversation is the material resources that it is required to even go to graduate school, to even go to college, aren't necessarily available to everyone. So, um, you know, I paid my way through college. I paid my way, you know, I was able to get in, in the social sciences, it's not as like guaranteed that you're gonna get funding. Um, but, you know, there's not very many like really rich grad students, right? But if you have resources that you can draw on to help you through that time, even the transition from postdoc to getting that first job can be vulnerable um, financially. Um, and so these are kinds, and you have to move and you have to reestablish and, you know, build community. You have to do all of these things, but you also have to make a living. I think that's where some of the inequalities start, you know, making people decide where, where do I want to, you know, invest my time. And maybe Al could uh, speak something to this because you were in industry. I, I came from industry, worked for eight years in the biotech industry, got a master's, got my PhD, and my first job was the same pay as I was getting 10 years before. And so, you know, clearly there is a gap. And, you know, I don't know if that, it, and there's a lot of reasons why it was so low. It was right after the recession, um, but there was a lot of things else going on. Yeah, well, you know, I, I think uh, just um, thinking back on the, the previous conversation to the, the number that I've heard of uh, PhD scientists moving on to get, um, you know, to become a professor in, the in their respective fields is something like 5%. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that, that's of everybody. And then you take some very small proportion of that uh, being black, then, you know, that, we get a very, very small number. And, um, you know, and, and so I know we, we are having this discussion around, you know, the great aspects of being a professor and, you know, th they're there. Clearly, I'm here for those reasons, too. Uh, but, you know, I, I made the choice, uh, a personal choice to, to go into industry first. You know, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a first generation college student. My, you know, so my dad um, is from uh, Richland, South Carolina, the rural part of South Carolina. And, you know, all he told me when I was going to college, getting ready to call, go to college is, you know, hey, you, you got to make a lot of money. Like, wh whatever you do, yeah. just make some money. Right. And I, I think that really stuck with me. And, you know, going, so going into college, I, I didn't have this idea that, oh, yeah, I'm going to be a professor, you know, uh, or not even you know, I'm going to be a scientist or, or NASA scientist. Right. It was just, you know, I need to figure out how I'm going to come out and make money. And, you know, lucky for me, I, I had you know, someone who who, uh, who stopped me early and said, hey, look, you, you should think about STEM. You should think about science. And, and you know, and, you know, that that's where I start, started to get this interest in, hey, you know, I, actually, there are opportunities here. Uh, of course, you, you look at the salaries and, you know, I have to say that that did drive me. Um, and, you know, coming out into industry, uh, the, the money was was good. You know, it's it's better than what I make now, uh, but yeah, you know, that that's okay. I, as you know, I, I think um, because it also gave me the the opportunity to explore a different world. And, and so here, you know, I just want to say that you know, going into industry uh, it is not uh, such a such a bad thing. That there are opportunities there too. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, Simone. Did you have something to say? I don't remember if you wanted to chime in. 
No, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> it got a little, it, it, there was a lot of people but kind of popping up at a, at a moment there, which is great. Um, I love these, uh, these discussions. Um, so one of the things that came up in the Dean's discussion as well as the faculty um, was um, the need um, for faculty underrepresented minorities to really um, want to not only be excellent researchers, but they also want to mentor, you know, black and brown students, whether they be undergrads, graduate students. However, this can be taxing on time. Um, it often doesn't count towards promotion and tenure. And for, but for some, for some folks, this work, you know, it feeds your soul, you know, um, um, and ignoring it is like ignoring a part or compartmentalizing who you are and why you actually got into this, um, this area of, of your career in the first place. Um, and one of the, uh, I guess in the Zoom Q&A, one way um, um, it was uh, a question that was responded in, in, in regards to this is that one way a graduate or postdoc students can better support, the question was how can graduate or postdoc students better support black and minority uh, non-tenure faculty um, is to nominate them for awards, um, offer to write letters of recommendation or letters of support for their tenure file, um, and you know the deans were really talking, and it seemed serious that these might there might be avenues here um, where this kind of um, invisible work that's very important to faculty um, of color um, should be and can be, or maybe there is a way it can be counted towards actual service that is really important not only for the person doing the work and the people who are receiving this kind of uh, mentorship but also for the goals of the university and so I was wondering if anybody wanted to think of are there other ways we can put this into place or does it even make sense to do this kind of sort of uh, institutional uh, integration of, of, of identifying this as legitimate valuable service um, that shouldn't only be excluded to, you know, faculty of color, but for for lots of folks. Any thoughts? Is my man Ed jumping on to respond. Is that what's happening? <laughs> well, uh, you know, I, I had I have a a bit of a different you know take on it in terms of you know moving forward in and 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 thinking about our coalition and how we leverage it. You know, one of the things that I take away uh, from the discussion is something that I've been li literally living with and was staring me right in the face because my wife is a professor that I never really thought about until yesterday was that, wow, she really does have it harder than me. As hard as I have it, she has it harder. And I've always known that. But I never broadened it to considering the, you know, kind of circumstances of other women faculty. You know, I haven't really thought about the, the issue and the challenges facing, you know, some of my African-American female graduate students from the perspective of the added burdens that, you know, they were living with, which kind of convicted me and surprised me. And so I've, I've just been thinking about that issue. So what I, what I actually wanted to bring up is, is, is somewhat kind of parallel to this and that one of the elephants in the room when I've had discussions about diversity is, and it's never vocalized this way, but kind of the tension between gender diversity and you know kind of ethnic and underrepresented minority diversity. That is to say, you know, you know, at least in my experience, I've seen what felt like a competition between the two for resources. And oftentimes gender diversity, particularly white female gender diversity, you know, getting a level of focused attention in the way that I had a harder time seeing underrepresented minority diversity advancing as explicitly. And I'm just wondering, you know, how we go about kind of moving forward toward any solution with the broadest possible and most coherent coalition that we can without 
kind of factionalizing it, right? Because I can fully acknowledge the, you know, kind of the struggles of African-American women now and want to be a part of the, the solution that, you know, kind of shoulders more of that burden and helps people like Simone, you know, into the academy, right? But, you know, the, the challenge is not only theirs, you know, you know, I think we all have our own challenges. And so I guess my question is, I just, I don't feel like we've talked as much about the diversity of our coalition and, and where and how we would actually target solutions toward the areas of greatest need, if that makes any sense. Thank you. Yeah, this is a, uh, uh, I mean, just even the question about, I think a question that's coming up um, is, um, uh, how do, how do we even think about diversity? I mean, I think women in the room um, who are in academia certainly understand some of the, um, the challenges that, I mean, we learned this yesterday too, right? From um, the faculty panel um, um, and it is very different, um, but similar, right? There's similar um, barriers that we experience. Um, and, and so how do we even define um, diversity um, and, and this kind of difference, um, um, it's going to depend on who you ask um, in, in, in any particular context. Um, and so when we're thinking about um, action, um, when we're thinking about uh, disruptive action, um, I, I, I think we have um, 20 minutes till five o'clock. Um, maybe we could start thinking about what that action might look like. Um, when um, I wanted to draw on a quote from one of the uh, administrators in thinking about this, um, and this was from the first panel, um, Felicia Benton Johnson from Georgia Tech, um, she sta stated, you know, how do we go from the past and take this moment in time and keep the fire burning? Um, what are the ways we can start to imagine forms of disruptive action um, that will substantially change all the issues? Well, you know, maybe some of the issues that we've experienced and learned about uh, in this conference. Um, one of the things that I think Ruha was really sort of motioning towards, and there was a little bit of discussion, was really how do we begin to integrate issues of social and racial justice in all our curriculum? Um, you know, we have an audience of, of, of people who are learning um, about what, what science is, what technology is, um, and it's been stated a few times in this panel, to my pleasure, that it's not value free, right? It's embedded in, you know, ideas um, of what, 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 how we categorize human beings, you know, I teach a course on race, medicine, and science um, that really address these kinds of issues that are embedded historically, and students tell me, I can't believe this, right? Science should be value free, it shouldn't be um, situated um, based on preconceptions. Um, and so is this a way forward um, in terms of um, demanding more integration of critical thinking in this way? And I think this is really where we're not just talking about STEM here, we're talking about you know, universities that have these capacities to work together. Um, and so I was hoping we can talk, maybe, maybe this is, should this be a priority? Um, or, or is it um, in some of the universities um, that are represented here? Um, there isn't a lot, I know at Georgia Tech, I think the engineering students got one elective. And so even though we have a minor in social justice, it's not necessarily something that they would want to do or have the capacity to do. So how can we do it better? Can I, I wanna jump in and I definitely think that that is such a, you know that I think that that's such a worthwhile conversation. There was something else towards the beginning of your reflections that just, um, sort of compels me to um, just suggest, like for us to think about how the language of, you know, being a professor as a calling and all of the, the wonderful things that we get to do, how it can 
work against an identity of ourselves, understanding of ourselves as workers with other workers in an institution. I was on a uh, listening in on a com panel conversation a couple of days ago of um, doctors who do a lot of um, labor organizing in hospital settings. And one of the ongoing challenges is because of the very similar to academia, the how hierarchical that setting is, the people at the top have even a hard time identifying with the struggles and the challenges and the concerns of people all the way down the, the, the spectrum. And so part of the challenge is to even think of ourselves um, as workers. So then we begin to think about our labor. So then we start thinking about mentoring and advising. And to the extent that these remain informal things that we do that are not explicit and formalized as a part of our work, it will always invariably fall to the people whose identities are thought to naturally gravitate towards mentoring and advising. And this goes to Edward's conversation about the gender dimensions of this labor. And so as long as it remains informal, then it will be women, but it will be women of color, but it will be black women who are the ones who shoulder the great burden or, or privilege of doing the large majority of this. So there's a whole conversation, I think, about, un, again, formalizing our work so that as part of making it more equitable and formalizing it, whether it's in the context of unions and other ways of organizing. And then the last thing I'll say, just to be as provocative as I can, and maybe we don't talk about it today, maybe we do, but it might be that we have to abolish tenure to actually create an equitable academy. Hmm. Ravana, you had your hand up. I did, and I, I just wanna, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if this is what you meant, Ruha, in terms of thinking about workers, if it was just sort of academic workers, or about workers in general within the campus. But one of the reasons why I was excited to take part in the series is because that academic hierarchy very much impacts um, black women, um, often who have PhDs and decided not to go into teaching, but instead decided to go into student support because they experienced and witnessed the problems. Mm -hmm. um, but in that hierarchy, they can, and we, I'll say we, can end up even below students in terms of the credibility and perspective that we have and what people hear. Um, and, and it's something that I, I think is, um, I think when we were talking about the planning discussion, I was at another institution where very small numbers of black faculty, very small numbers of black staff, very small numbers of black students, they were not talking to each other. And it's mm -hmm. like, there just are not enough of us in this enterprise for us to organize ourselves in that way. And I think students see that hierarchy pretty quickly. And because they do want to be like faculty, even if they're not going into the academy, they will sometimes sort of replicate some of those perspectives and behaviors, even in their interactions with people who have made it their business to help them succeed. Um, so I think that's something else as we think about advancing and where we go and how we can better uh, organize um, to advance diversity, to advance equity, to advance inclusion, is to really just sort of be mindful about who we are, who's invested in the work, and not fall back on, oh, this is a faculty discussion or this is a student discussion, but this is a, a discussion around people who understand that we have to advance together. And, you know, as we talk about common fate, right, so we talk about um, George Floyd and how that this has sort of precipitated a lot of those discussions. Again, we have this common fate. We are black people, we are in different positions, but even more so we have a common fate as being members of the academy and to whatever degree, you know, we are impacted by that. So just sort of thinking more critically about, again, who we include in these discussions, uh, how we reference the experience, um, and then how gender and race actually play into where you might even be considered as for an entry point into the academy. There are many colleagues who started along an academic path. Um, you know, sometimes they consciously chose to go into administration. Other times that was what was available to them. And talk about not being in a secure spot 
um, of all the panels, I think the, the, the administrators had to be most careful about what they said because <laughs> they are not in a secure spot. But at the same time, they're having to take some risk in terms of, again, advancing this agenda and advancing the goals. So yeah, I, I totally appreciate expanding that conversation, but also just sort of thinking more critically about those voices and, and how we're connected. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Can I just thank both Ravada and Rua for those comments just now? Um, and maybe Ed helped kick it off. I just like to give Ed credit for things. Um, but Ravana brought up some things that I've really learned again from talking to the Black female academic support and staff, right? I mean, I've, you know, I might be the PI on a grant that runs a program, but there is a Black woman program manager, program director that makes that thing run, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and what we see even from students, that person, I, I don't want to use the term, but they look at that person like almost as a mom figure. Like that person has helped them through so much more besides just getting those grades it is about when i was dealing with stress I, you know and and i'd like to always big up my one lakita surveillance i'm going to say her name because she and i have been working together for eight years and she helps me with every single program that i run and one thing that and i'm curious how you all respond to this one thing that i really wanted to take on for her um is to push her out there more because i want her to get the credit for the things that she does because she is a, like she's a genius at how she does it, right? But at the same time, I also want to push her to understand like, hey, maybe listen to the science this time because if you can start responding to the science a bit, then the students will respect you on all angles and not just look at you as, hey, can you help me with this and that? Because she is an independent thinker. She, she, she contribute ideas and she has ideas, but she's like, well, I'm not sure. And I'm like, no, I want you to be here, right? And because it's Bravada makes this point so clear that Professors do have this job security, and then the staff might not. And it, it's clear when the grant is getting ready to end or when the other things are getting ready to happen and you feel the tension rise about how will I continue to be paid. Mm -hmm. and, and it's like Tyrone said, we stress on that because I want her to be my partner throughout this entire career because she, or better than me, right? Because she's just that good. But I, I think it hasn't been said in a broad space the way Ravana put it, just so clearly that they are vulnerable population in the academy. But I always, again, all the black women that work with me, the administrative assistants, the support staff, plus the program managers, that's why things get done. Because they want professors to do all these other things. So I want to thank you for that statement. Well, and shout also, out again, Lakita Servance is everything. Okay. But also the themes that were in the student panel and also in the faculty panel are, that's not our job. You're asking to do things that are not our role. So whose role is it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whose role is it? And if you really think this important work is someone else's role, how are you empowering and acknowledging them? And, and again, it's this staff, you know, coming from, you know, an African-American experience, we know what staff means, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> we know the tone where that's leveraged. Oh, they're the staff. You know, those are the people who are the wait staff the cleaning staff, and that they're all lumped in together, even if you have an advanced degree, even if you went to an Ivy League institution, your title is, is just, you know, you're all together as the staff. And there's something in that. And I'd have to say that there's a gender dynamic, there's a racial dynamic that all leads into how that language is used and and operationalize, because that's also a way to dismiss you, the staff, right? right? Mm -hmm. So there we go. There's my soapbox. <laughs> yeah, yeah and I'm, I'm sure people have been, I know, you know, I've been mistaken for staff and because there's no way I could be the professor, right? Um, and um, maybe others have experienced that in other spaces as well. You were saying, Tyrone? Yeah, so I, I completely agree with the, the comments that have been made. And there is, so th this sort of also gets into the dark. So there's a hierarchy for sure within academia. Mm -hmm. There's biases that exist that Ravana, I think, had mentioned yesterday. Um, this is also a little bit of the dark side of being tenured, and in particular, tenured white faculty, because there is a, there is a, an era of superiority or elitism mm 
we discussed the elitism in the last panel. Mm -hmm. There's this air of elitism and you can only, there's a sense that you only see, or this is, this is my, per, my, my uh, conception, that you can only see eye to eye with someone that is at your position, that has your title, that has your credentials. And anyone that doesn't have that, that doesn't meet or exceed that bar, that you don't, you don't, really, you don't really acknowledge. I hear so many stories from the staff that they're just they're they're not treated they're not treated very well by the faculty. Let's be honest about that. They're 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 sort of they're they're mistreated. Um, there's there's no it's it's um, very impersonal, um, and and that's that's where that elitism comes in. And then you asked the Ravana asked the question, well, if, you know who's going to do the work, right? Who's going to do the diversity, equity, and inclusion work? And there's a lot of conversation over the last couple of days that the faculty need to step up. But if I'm tenured and I feel protected, I've sp I feel some level of security, what is going to incentivize me, right? I don't get the sense that there's a penalty that I have to be worried about. I was actually talking with uh, a colleague of mine uh, via text about if a faculty does act upon their implicit biases, and there are aggressions against a student, racial aggressions against a student. How do you discipline that faculty member? Mm -hmm. There's a white faculty member who does this. What happens to that white faculty member? How are they disciplined? I am them. How is this sort of brought to their attention, right? Um, if they're tenured, mm -hmm. right? How does that happen? And we were, and this, she's not black. We just went back and forth of like, I don't really, and, and she's more senior than I am. She was like, I don't really have a good answer to that. Mm -hmm. I don't. And the system doesn't really have a good answer to that. There's no real, that is system-wide. Universities might have their own policies and practices, but I'm talking system-wide. What are the structures to bring, you know, to bring people in? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fire them. I mean, I say fire them in the same space. I don't know if you all seen that Tamika Mallory clip when she says, arrest the cops, arrest all the cops. Like whatever this protection is for people who say sexist things or racist things to students, it's illegal. And most universities know who these people are because students have told before. And so what I realized is what can be done? Again, tenure does not mean you can never be fired. I think, again, we are all Agreed. fully clear on that. Agreed. It is about the institutions stepping up and saying, this is unacceptable. I don't care if this is a rainmaker. This behavior is unacceptable and stepping up and doing something about it. So Go before the mom makes her comment, I asked earlier about legal constraints. There is always an aversion to being sued. Right. And there's the concern that if I fire this person and it turns into this, he said, she said, he said, he said, back and forth, the, is the university going to take that risk? I personally wouldn't bank on it, personally. Mm -hmm. But that is a risk that, that goes into that risk assessment of disciplining or firing this person for some racial statement that they made that they were alleged to have made. We also have to remember they're alleged to have made that statement. And you have to convince that in the court of law. I, I'm with you, I'm with you, Manu. I'm not saying that is ridiculous. I'm just saying that that is a risk assessment that they're going to do inherently. And we have to acknowledge and accept that. Yeah, no, I just wanna say, you know, the, the, the title and of what has brought us all here today is disruptive action, right? And that idea of, you know, arrest the cops. Yeah, fire the professors. And on a, you know, from the student perspective, even wanting to report that, you, you might want to say something, but you know nothing is going to happen. So you don't say anything. And then records aren't made, right? It doesn't, it's not written down somewhere so that you have, you're not able to back it up later on. I do want to point out that yesterday when we were having our conversation about the response to, um, you know, the Black Lives Matter or, and protesting and George Floyd, and then um, compared to ICE and then Harvard and MIT suing the next day in the middle of our conversations, that was rescinded, right? So the student ban, it, you know, in all, it's, it's over. International students are, are, are protected, right? Legal action was taken, and then we see the result that we were looking for, right? So it's in- gotta, 
it's got to be a system response, right? Exactly. That was all of the institutions coming together. I'm pretty sure there are individual departments and institutions that have something in place. But for this to be corrected across the system, the system has to buy into this. Right, mm -hmm. exactly. And just like how it took what Harvard and MIT, they said, okay, we're, we're suing you know, the Trump administration, right? And then all these other schools, yeah, me too, me too. I'm in, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. That's exactly, that's exactly what we need right now to protect black students against, you know, against really professors who have tenure and might make silly statements like, oh, why can't it be like the good old days where the, the black men went to Morehouse, the black woman went to Spelman, and the men went to and the men went to Georgia Tech. Why can't it be like the good old days? That was said a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Emil, did you want to say something? Yeah, I think uh, it's they can always use this excuse about we don't want to take the risk. But if this is important to eliminate uh, systemic racism, we need to push them to take the risk. Let them sue. So what? Let's fight. You know, that's why you take it to the next level. You don't accept we can't do this because of what they're going to do. And we don't allow these institutions that, to give us that, that reason for not doing it. You know, if you want to take disruptive action, then you got to get after them. And whoever allows it to happen, as we say in the George Floyd, uh, issue, they're complicit. So they're racist like everybody else, and you don't you you don't cut them in the slack. You don't care if they're the president of the world. It's like we like to say, you take them on. Yeah, I'm thinking about. Um, I think what the the faculty or the the graduate student panel was just talking about how there's a lot of hate hate uh, protest on campus and how this creates a very unsafe space um, and can affect your physical and mental capacities, right? Um, but it's not something that is addressed. And so maybe there's tangible things that, um, you know, we can coalesce around where we want to create the environment where there is blatant racism happening right in front of us, right? Um, this isn't even the silent, you know, invisible uh, racism that's, that's harder to pinpoint. Um, and I think another thing that hasn't really been part of this conversation, we're all going to be heading back to campuses in one form or another, um, in a couple of weeks, right. In a month or so. Um, so we're, you know, we, I, well, I'm not even sure if I'll be on campus or if I'll be part on campus or not on campus at all, but I know that my students are dealing with a lot, especially the students, um, um, underrepresented minority students. And so thinking about their mental health and the kinds of um, issues that they're going to be faced with, I think um, that's an immediate um, concern that we need to be thinking about as well. And it's not something we really necessarily have talked about, um, but it's gonna impact their ability to learn. Um, and um, perform at the level that they're going to need to at the, the universities that we all occupy. Yeah, and it looks like Raheem, one of our faculty panelists, has joined. Yeah. Is it okay, he? Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm here. I've, I've, I've been uh, hiding. Um, so, so, so this has been great. I've enjoyed it. Um, a, a couple of things I want to make comments. So we talk about like these disruptive um, uh, things to the system. And, and you know, the last hour, hour and a half, I've, I've heard two things that were disruptive. One was Ruha saying, get rid of tenure. Uh, and the other was, uh, you know, Manu saying, you know, hey, we need fire. to, you know, we need to fire these folks. We need to make it easy to fire. So I, I would love to hear more um, very disruptive type responses. And, and I'm not saying we we, we, we go to those extremes necessarily, but I do think that, as I mentioned yesterday on the panel, we have to have fundamental changes. And I agree with, uh, with Emil that, listen, we, we, if, if this is the, the, the institution's values, if it's to ensure that everyone is treated well, uh, then who cares about a lawsuit? I mean, universities get sued all the time. We get sued all the time, right? So if this is important to us, uh, then, then we take the risk. So I, I, I would love to just talk more about if we could, like, what are some other crazy ideas? Because again, adding, I mean, I, you know, earlier I heard 
we need to add, we need to be more involved in faculty recruiting. Yeah. Okay. But that's what we've been doing. Mm -hmm. And look what we got, you know, uh, 0.4% apparently of the new engineering assistant professors from 2009 to 2018 were black. Right. So we got that from being more involved in the recruiting process. Right. So it, it ain't working. So what are we doing that is completely disruptive? And I would love to, if, if I could sort of, you know, inject that, that comment and hear more interesting ideas in that space. So I will say one thing, it might not seem like much, but as students, we are always, especially black students, we're always tapped to be in pictures to show that the, um, the department or the university is diverse. And more recently, we've been talking about, you know what, when we're asked as, as a group, we need to stop saying, Yes, and just see, see what happens, see what happens, because there are so few of us, and especially, you know, you look at some websites and you see that same person in every single photo, admittedly, been there. Yes, right? Manu. They, yeah. they, 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 would, they would find <laughs> that picture of Manu, they would find that picture of Manu and throw right. that back up there exactly. from like 15 so, years ago. You know, Stop being part. Or of they take a picture of my lab. They take a picture of my lab, and that's. <laughs> that's but yeah, stop being part of the PR and publicity because you're saying, "Oh, we are we're we're committed to diversity, equity, inclusion," and you're showing the same people over and over. Diversity is people. If you're showing the same person over and over again, that's individuality. That's an individual. So. Yeah. No, I like it. Yeah. Let's uh, hear from. Um, you're on. On mute. Camilla. Camilla, oh, yes. Oh. Hello. Uh, yeah, so I had uh, commitments sort of spilling over. So uh, thanks for uh, adding me to the discussion. Um, just to, I, to add to the list of disruptive actions, I don't have a clear way to articulate this as an action, but I'm just going to uh, propose it as a way for people who want to call out racism to have immunity. I want to be protected. Mm. Right. I don't want my job to be at risk because I said something truthful and it made somebody who's a decision maker really uncomfortable. So even mm. if, you know, there isn't a way to, yeah, in addition to the things to help to support my success. I mean, what, what I don't see in a lot of play, a, a lot of things that keeps, you know, all, you know, those of us who can call out racism silent is fear of repercussion. So if there's some creative way to, to protect a person, you know, I mean, you don't want to have to sit in a faculty meeting and say something that's going to make somebody, some fragile person squirm, right? <laughs> but sometimes it gets to that point where you have to say something. And it's kind of a shame that I have to hold that back because, you know, not only because it's going to make a person uncomfortable, but I have a real genuine fear that things aren't going to work out so well for me. Uh, in the end, when I'm being considered for a promotion or tenure or whatnot. And for the students, when they have to, you know, one day they want to call out this professor for saying something inappropriate, but oh, in a couple of weeks, I have to stand in front of this person for a qualifying exam, right? So, if, you know, any kind of mechanism to really empower and give people the freedom to say things that, that are going to call these things out. Now, it doesn't, you know, actually solve any problems, but it would just be in addition to uh, the other disruptive acts. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Tyrone, you had your hand up? Yeah, so maybe you all know that I'm from Detroit originally. And so I grew up with the bad boys. Uh, the Detroit Pistons have won back-to-back -back NBA titles. And one of the players on that team was Dennis Rodman before he went crazy. And they were one of the most heavily fined teams in history. If you can find people in other occupations, other types of employment for stupid things they do or say, in the cases where maybe it's more challenging to fire them, and maybe you do what Emil had mentioned, you take it, you just, and, and Raheem also has, has interjected, you, if you gotta go to court, you gotta go to court. But maybe as a starting point, you start issuing fines. $10,000 for the stupid thing that you did last week. Oh, oh you did it again? No, the $10,000. That's $20,000. And what, what seems to happen, unless once again you're Dennis Rodman, is that once you start cutting into people's paycheck, they start to reconsider their behaviors a little bit. Yeah, and then take the money and use it to fund diversity and inclusion initiatives. 
Yeah. We find them and then find <laughs> some initiatives. I'm with you know what? Uh, some, um, when you finish them with your postdoc, um, you, you need to holler at me so we can get you on the <laughs> get you on the faculty. <laughs> Everybody holler at your girl. Come on, Simone. Okay. <laughs> I, would just, I would just add one thing. Um, it seems like one of the sentiments here is that we really want an anti-racism mm -hmm. um, support, not just diversity. Diversity is one thing, but being right. anti-racist mm -hmm. is a whole different um, mm -hmm. um, beast and, a, and it'll take different mechanisms to combat that. I mm -hmm. like the idea of hitting people where it hurts and usually finances is, is a space where it hurts. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah, um, maybe there needs to be more. So Boston University did just hire uh, Ibram Kendi and he is starting a center for anti-racist research. So maybe there needs to be more universities that are investing significantly in that. Um, that then serves as intellectual sort of space on the campus that then could be, that could permeate the rest of the campus, right? Mm -hmm. these, these, these sort of conversations, uncomfortable conversations and training for faculty um, that echoes what Tequila has just added to the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe the fines that are utilize right and collect her from these faculty end up going into that anti-racist research center mm -hmm. mm. yeah I'll, I'll, yeah so, so what I, I actually wanted to make one comment um perhaps a you know a disruptive action uh, because we haven't really talked about uh money and resources directly um, you know, I, I did college athletics and, you know, I was, I was running, you know, track at University of Maryland and, you know, Title IX was, you know, a very significant factor in diversifying NCAA athletics in the area of, particularly in the area of, of, of you know, sex and gender. And it put constraints on what would have otherwise been a you know kind of doubling down in some of the historic inequities in how certain athletic programs were invested in and so is there a form of constraint that could be placed on either at the local level in terms of institutions or among extramural funders that if these same patterns of inequity exist in terms of funding rates and the right you know, the rightful share of underrepresented minority applicants that you can't continue to funnel money, you know, disproportionately without taking some type of corrective action to balance the scales. Because at the end of the day, you know, I, I, I'd like for us to propose something that would be, you know, disruptive that ends up, you know, kind of advancing the cause of those of us who are, you know, still engaged in the struggle. And I've, I've you know, and I, I've, I've been in multiple conversations now about kind of these issues of, of funding, both in terms of local university budgets and extramural funders, but I just haven't had a lot of conversations about proposed solutions. And if that's what we're about, I just like to hear some other ideas to address this one. No, I like that, man. So I, you know, and, and I'm sorry to jump in. Try, so if NSF and NIH, said, you did just what, you cannot get more than this amount of money unless you have this percentage of black faculty. I guarantee you all the pipeline issues that we hear about, all the I can't find folks that you listen here. <laughs> we will be a, a much more diverse institution, all of them overnight, overnight. So that's the fun. If Congress tells NSF, hey, if y'all don't tell them to diversify, we ain't giving you more, you more money. I guarantee you NSF will do it, right? So I agree, it's all, about, it's all about money and we have to have the will to do these things, right? We talked about, you know, like these penalties for, for faculty. We already know how to punish faculty when they do things that we don't tolerate, right? We just need to add this to the list of things that we don't tolerate, right? It's not hard, there's a process in place. So if we, if we treat 
diversity and, and, and this anti-racism as a real problem, like all these other problems and process problems that we have at universities, there are already processes in place to do these things, right? I mean, you look at like supply diversity, for example, that's one thing I, I hope that we adopt at, at Georgia Tech and, and I hope that other universities do it. You know, before we get, before anybody comes to try to sell us anything, we need to ask, how many women do you have in leadership? How many African-Americans do you have? And I want to know all these things. I may still accept for bid, but I want to know these things, right? So law, so big, big companies do this when they, when they get to like law firms, when they, when they uh, dole out their work, right? So all of it, and I agree, Ed, all of it comes down to money. And, you know, it may not change hearts, but it will certainly change actions. And then over time, perhaps you'll get those to, to actually change hearts. I, I think that's a good idea. The, the only caveat that I, I would throw in there is that making sure, and I think Rahim, you were kind of getting to that with the different percentages of not, not just staff members, like those who are in, in charge of certain um, programs, but also tenure track faculty members and those who might just be more um, of adjunct professors or lecturers and making sure those percentages are, are equal across the board. But I would also add that it's not just you have the numbers that are there, but it's that inclusive part. You have resources in place to make sure that people are, those people are successful and students continue to matriculate. Absolutely. Yeah, so, so I, I, you know, I, I agree that money, money is important here and can be a big driver. Uh, but I've been thinking a lot about the student panel yesterday, and uh, this, you know, someone had used the term uh, cultural competency, and you know what I see is a, a lack of cultural competency that led to a slow response after, um, you know, the the racial instances that have occurred, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, versus a fast response or you know what i saw was a, a very good competency cultural competency uh when you know you had someone reaching out to the student and even going beyond that realizing that you know the student might need that additional attention and, and you know th this type of competency is is not inherent it, it's it's learned mm -hmm. and uh to me I don't understand why there's not mandatory formal training for faculty, for all faculty coming in. And the one aspect that we never learn how to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, being a good mentor, uh, understanding how to become um, advocates. You know, I, I mean, I, I think that, that type of change can also uh, change the environment that we have on campus. And it might be a different way that we might be able to tackle this problem. Mm -hmm. Can I jump in here? You know, one thing that I've been thinking about lately, too, is um, just like we have to do our, for those who do wet lab, our chemical safety training, basic lab safety training every year, let's do annual anti-racist training, because it's easy to slip up <coughs> and forget what you learned one year, or some new data, some new information, or a new better way to train the faculty will come out. I mean, like bloodborne pathogens at my department, we've got to take that every three years just to make sure you're tight. Let's do that for anti-racist training so that again, you have to continually remind people to do these anti-racist, anti-sexist, anti-homophobic, anti-trans behaviors to make sure they stay fresh. Mm -hmm. Manu, I would, I would add to that. It shouldn't be something that's done simply on a computer. That can be one way, but it also should be done in real time. Mm -hmm. um, I've been part of leadership programs where we literally sat in a room and did bias training, where you were separating yourself based on different privileges and different biases that you may have had. And some people were aware and some people were, weren't aware, but it makes it more real mm -hmm. whenever you do it in reality and not virtually. So I would say that it needs to also be something that's done in in real time and in real space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just quick, if I oh. can jump in really quickly. So um, I, you know, on, on my way in, all right, so this is my in office day with our staggered <laughs> schedule. And I stopped by to, to chat with a colleague and I'm not gonna put any names out there, but he shared with me yet another, it's like, I, I keep hearing about these incidences left and right where Black student goes down a hall somewhere and security stops and interrogates them. 
and in this particular case, we're shocking. I don't want to give any details about the student, but it was the way he described it. It was, it was one of those things. And then so the, on this topic of, you know, training and anti-racism, I think another, um, you know, with all the different ways you can do it, it sends a clear message that we are not going to let this fly. It is not okay. It is not up to your own little personal decision and, oh, this is the way I do things in culture and whatever other BS gaslighting excuse you can come up with to continue to bully and, and make our students feel uncomfortable, that course not only would be there to inform, but to send a clear message, this is not acceptable behavior. I mean, shoot, it's, it seems like Title IX training was put together far ahead. I mean, I don't see any anti-racism training, but we have a very nice, or at least before I left ASU, there was a very nice Title IX online training. And it was beautiful. It even instructed people on, okay, what do you do when someone reports? an incident to you. There was even information for that. Mm -hmm. So as a start, right, I definitely agree with um, Dr. Harris that, you know, we need to make sure that the, the training is well-rounded. Um, but even as like, a, that could be the primary course. And then the yearly refreshers could be something that, you know, like what Manu is talking about, that we have to do for safety. Um, where is it? Where is that? Mm -hmm. Racism is a public health problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and if we haven't realized that after decades of lynchings and what have you, I mean, come on, <laughs> if people get with the program. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah. I, I just I just wanted to add that you know, I, I think that this should be something that's mandatory, right? Not optional and not for the people who are interested. You know, the, the same reason I give my students to go to seminars they're not interested in, you never know when you're going to learn something new. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's much like, um, you know, the um, human subjects research training that we have to do in order for me to do my research. I have to, you know, make sure that I'm up whatever, whether it's clinical or just, you know, basic human subjects research. I have to do that training. Um, I think it would be more effective in person. Um, and it does sometimes feel a little um, redundant because you do it over and over. But you know they're speaking to the choir when I'm 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 taking these 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 um, these trainings. But there's lots of folks that won't voluntarily do it unless they have to. Um, and that I mean that kind of just plays into the point of I'm sorry you're going to be uncomfortable for an hour training mm -hmm. session. I'm uncomfortable every day. Like right. I live in this black skin. When I wake mm -hmm. up, I'm black. I go to work, I'm black. I go to sleep, I'm black. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry if you're uncomfortable for an hour. But I really think that empathy can just go such a long way with all of this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Welcome to my world. No, I, I like it. So I might be on an island with this one, but you know, um, I grew up in South Carolina, uh, you know, and um, you know, I, I've told stories before. I won't go into detail about how some of the relationships that I've had with people in authority or, you know, kind of um, uh, white people who were kind of in my friendship groups were re really uncomfortable because, you know, some racist sentiment gets, you know, kind of unearthed at, you know, um, you know, and sometimes at a time where patience is running thin and, you know, things happen, you know, and, but one of the things I took away from those circumstances was the work that it took to in in certain cases not all to repair those relationships and to mend what was you know to mend what was broken and i'm not disagreeing with the the ideas or even the sentiment behind firing racists right and i'm certainly not disagreeing with the idea that we would be much more trend you know kind of committed to the, you know, the, you know, the virtue of anti-racism in how we discipline faculty, you know, as, as Raheem said. But, you know, when I think about the fact that in this country, we never really had kind of a truth and reconciliation commission after racism and Jim Crow. I mean, I, I, you know, when you look at other cultures, I feel like that is a huge missed opportunity. I feel like there is a then I, I think that there is a need for the, you know, the world to hear 
some of the success stories about how anti-racism training and experiences actually lead to the, you know, kind of transformed hearts. That is to say, racists become anti-racists. Mm -hmm. And I feel like there's got to be some, you know, some way of providing a, at least in my opinion, you know, kind of a pathway to redemption. <laughs> As we begin to daylight these examples of racism, that if those people can embrace some type of opportunity to acknowledge their role in kind of race, systemic racist practice, that you know there there would be, you know, there there, there could there, they could regain some level of acceptance. I you know I just think that there needs to be an arm that includes that as you know an outcome. There's a great TED talk by Heather McGee. Um, she used to be the president of Demos, and she has a book out too, I think. But her TED talk is about how racism hurts everyone, mm -hmm. and she's the one who those recognize. She was the woman, black woman on C-SPAN, and this white racist guy called in and then said, "You know, I'm a racist, but I don't want to be. Can you?" First, he said some racist things to her, and then he, and they had built a friendship. And then, you know, as Ed was suggesting, she counseled him out of it. But I think that the first part of what her TED talk is new is out is about how racism hurts everyone, not just white people. I mean, not just black people. And Jonathan Metzl from Vanderbilt, who Jennifer, we, we know from other spaces, has a book that's out called Dying of Whiteness mm -hmm. and about how by upholding racist principles and not wanting black and brown people to have certain things, it's killing white people also. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the larger education that if you realize this is not making you better, it's not putting you above anyone else, it is actually harmful to you, to our country. It is super harmful to our country that it is the most, that is the easiest way for those that are our country's enemies to get in and break us apart. That's the broader education, which again, that's not even, I mean, I guess we're in the academy, so we should be promoting that education. But those are some things that if the broader group would just get that you're not just hurting us, Mm -hmm. You are just hurting our country and, and everything that we can move forward, which is what South Africa did with the Truth and Reconciling Commission. So, mm -hmm. just want to bring that up. Heather, Heather Demos, check out her TED talk, and mm -hmm. that Jonathan Metzl book, Dying of Whiteness, which is both really, really powerful. Yeah, and I know one of the things that Georgia Tech is doing um, through um, the Diversity and Equity um, Office is um, they have these transformative narratives that um, people can um, share. You know whether you know whether um, it's an experience that you had with racism or your identity and race or a time where you like really sort of saw a moment and you didn't say something and people sort of reflecting and they, these are all available um, online um, and um, you know they they spent a lot of time with these folks to actually um, um, learn you know have a good way to articulate what their story was and then they have sort of forums like this where you listen and then you actually talk. And this might be someone you know, this might be your colleague, right? And you can learn something that you had no idea about this person. And it's just an open conversation. I don't know that it's definitely uh, disruptive, but it is a, um, a, an initiative here at Georgia Tech that I that I've, I recently listened to a couple of them um, and was part of um, you know the back and forth and just learning from others about their unique experiences here on campus or just in their lives more generally. So I guess uh, we are we are reaching um, the five thirty hour, and this has been such a fabulous uh, discussion. I think. Um, I have here in my notes that um, um, someone is taking notes about all of these wonderful ideas of disruptive action um, and is generating a list um, that could be then circulated and maybe added to. Um, were there any other ideas or any other lingering thoughts that um, anybody wanted to share before, before we close? I think... Um, We've heard a lot. I want to thank Rahim for sort of pushing us towards that um, direction at the end. Um, and um, this has been a fabulous um, opportunity to learn um, from you all. And I hope um, those in the audience who are still with us are um, um, 
benefited benefited as well. Um, it seems that the deans were listening. Um, just listening to what they had to say was a reflection, really, what was spoken um, on uh, yesterday. Um, and so, holding our leadership accountable to some of the, I mean, they weren't making promises, but they were definitely thinking about ideas of how it could be made better. Um, so ways that we can move forward, I'm sure, might be part of an agenda. I don't know what the future of the um, organizing committee had for this group. Um, so I'll, I'll just jump in quickly, Jennifer. So first, thank you for moderating this last panel and for providing summations of all the other panels to generate this discussion. Um, there is a broader group that was planning this. Um, I think Pat Staten at University of Washington spearheaded the discussion and started to bring us together. Um, Tyrone Porter, Terry Ward, um, Ravana Popoff was on the committee. There were several others, but I also want to thank the technical staff who made this come over smoothly which is Ranske Diadoff, Amanda Lynn McCracken, Paul Newbert, Corinne Shelley. There's just so many people that were involved besides the one that you see on the surface. And so the idea is that we will continue this work. There will be some, um, hopefully some literature or white papers that will be developed out of some of the thoughts. So if panelists get, if we reach out to you later, stay tuned. But I just, Pat, do you want to come and say any final closing thoughts since you've been quiet the whole time and allowed us to center black voices? Just, <laughs> you've been really <laughs> respectful about that, but. Oh, they've just been cutting me off, Manu. I, believe me, I've been, I've been jumping up and down, yelling and screaming the whole time. Uh, I, you know, I'm a white man, and I do have a, a lot of anger. I got to tell you, it comes from somewhere deep down inside of me. And so, I love you all. You were so inspiring. Your voices were loud and clear, and uh, it was a thrill for me just to be part of it. But like I said, I, I've got a lot of anger inside of me and I want to do disruptive actions with you going forward. We're going to, we've got a lot of ideas. I've already floated two to my Dean without her asking. Uh, and I just look forward to this interinstitutional approach. I think we can do some really important things together this way and apply some unique peer pressure that works in academia. I love the sociologists coming on. Uh, I think we have to really include their perspective, their knowledge, and mainly I'm here to help and, and work with you. I just think the world of all of you and I wanna do whatever I can. So that's what I got to say. Okay. I guess that's it, I thanks. Wanna, uh, just, just real quick, I, mean, I, wanna, I just wanna just, I feel like I need to just make this statement. I mean, Pat did sort of bring, he, he coalesced everyone. He brought everyone together into one room, into one space to form the committee to actually even make this happen. Just, just through some conversations on the side with a few people. And he said, you know, why don't we actually have open conversation at all levels in terms of the constituents at a university to really put this out there and on the table and see where it goes, right? And see what kind of ideas are generated. And I wanna, I wanna just acknowledge him for being the impetus to actually get all of this together. Now he has been quiet, he has been in the background throughout this, um, but he really helped drive this and bring this together such that we could all come together and have these conversations. So. So thank you, uh, Pat, for, for doing that. Yeah, thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Everyone okay. take care. Be safe. You too. Bye, y'all.